Okay, members, you're very welcome to this meeting of the Education Committee. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to keep all members in the spotlight for the next four items? Uh, move to agenda item one, apologies. Can I ask members if you're aware of any apologies? No. Okay, any apologies, Clark? No. Okay, thank you. Agenda item two then, members, is chairperson's business. Agenda item 2.1 is post-primary transfer testing. Can I refer members to correspondence from PPTC at page 5 of your packs and correspondence from AQE at page 3 of your tabled packs? Uh, can I remind members that at our last meeting it was agreed to invite PPTC and AQE to brief the committee at our meeting today uh, due to the urgent circumstances that pertain in relation to testing. Daniel, I think you might want to mute yourself there just to let you know. Daniel, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're coming and going, Chair. Okay, well, we can hear you just to let you know as well, okay? I'll try and make sure you can hear me. Robbie, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Okay, as I was saying, members, um, we had agreed to invite PPTC and AQE to brief the committee today, given the urgent issues in relation to transfer tests. PPTC um, has responded to say that there are no representatives available at this time uh, and provided the committee with a written briefing paper, I think from May 2020, and a recent press release. AQE has also responded um, to advise that its representatives are also unable to attend the Education Committee at this time. The committee also agreed uh, remotely, uh, subsequent to its last meeting, to invite the Education Minister on the matter of post-primary transfer at the earliest opportunity. The Minister was unable to attend today. Can I suggest to members uh, that the invitation to the Education Minister um, remains live and that we uh, communicate to the Education Minister that um, we would be grateful for him to attend the committee at his earliest convenience in relation to post-primary transfer testing and in particular I would specify in relation to his comments that the cancellation of the testing um, quote limits children's opportunities. Our member, do members wish to respond to that agenda item? Are members content to agree? Agreed. Agreed. Tim, I, I'm struggling here. Um, just, it's, it's difficult. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll ask if uh, we can check with Assembly Communications, if they can check that. <clears throat> um, I'm hearing all of you loud and clear, so ap apologies that that's not the case for you. Um, Karen, did you did you catch any of that? Do you want me to summarise very briefly? Could you summarise it, please? Yeah, so we had invited PPTC, AQE, in relation to post-primary transfer testing to the Education Committee today, and both organisations were un unable to attend. Um, we had also invited the Education Minister on post-primary transfer testing and he was also unable to attend. I would propose that we um, continue our, our invitation to the Education Minister at his earliest convenience, uh, particularly in relation to his comments that the cancellation of the tests, quote, limits children's opportunities, end quote. Members wish to respond to that item? Agreed, Chair. Agreed. Okay. Just one, just one point, Chair. Probably, yes. Yeah, just with regard to AQ and PBTC, um, in terms of the follow-up to that, I think it's imperative that we get them in at the earliest opportunity. Um, not so much for this cohort, um, this, this P7 cohort, but more for the P6s that are there. So we, what we want to know, what we'll be seeking, to be fair, and sure some of them will be listening in, is what uh, lessons have been learned and what they're proposing to do uh, to put mitigations and contingencies in for, for next year, given that this year was an unmitigated disaster. 
um, by, by a lot of the people in, in, involved in trying to look after the, this P, cohort of P7s. Okay, um, that's helpful, Robbie. Um, so we I'll, I'll perhaps turn that into a proposal, Robbie. Are we can, content that we respond to PPTC and AQE to express regret that they were have, are unable to attend at this time? Well, chair, but yes, yeah, sorry, Daniel, go ahead. I think you're being very polite, and I can understand as chair that you would be. But this isn't that they're unavailable. This is obviously that they're avoiding accountability by this committee uh, and uh, the, let's, let's face it they haven't exactly made themselves readily available to individual parties or members uh, so they're certainly not going to be running into their way to make themselves available to us but we should stress to them that this is about the many young people out there that they have failed and let down and it's very clear that they have no contingency in place otherwise they'd be coming to this committee to present what that would be. <coughs> okay thanks Daniel. Any other members wish to respond? Okay. Been advised I need to move closer to the microphone. Has that helped? <laughs> Has that helped, folks? Uh, do you like the sound of your voice, Chair? Yes. <laughs> no, I don't. I really don't. So I apologise for it in advance. Um, any other members wish to comment on that item? No? Okay. So I, I propose then, in addition to... Uh, extending our invitation to the Education Minister uh, that we also respond also respond to PPTC. Chair, Chair, someone's mic is not on mute. It's on here. It's off. I think it is genuinely someone's mic. I think if we can all check. Okay. There's also some background noise outside. Apologies. Um, we're endeavouring to maintain ventilation in the room and that has its Hazards. Okay. Perhaps so you can. You can... Me to stop the rain. <laughs> Perhaps you can hear me now. So we'll also respond to PPTC and AQE to express regret that it was not possible to attend the committee at this time in relation to this year's transfer testing, um, and extend the invitation to attend the committee at the earliest convenience in relation to lessons learned this year, um, which obviously has not been concluded yet, and I'm acutely aware of how many children and parents remain extremely concerned and distressed in relation to that. Um, we will continue to do what we can in whatever forum we have available to us in that regard, um, but to extend that invitation for lessons learned and what preparations are being made um, to improve this for everyone concerned next year. Are members content with those proposals? Content. Agreed. Okay. Thank you, members. I move then to agenda item 2.2 and refer members to an item table today from the Finance Committee Clerk forwarding a letter from the Economy Committee to the Department for Economy reminding of timeframes for the provision of budget briefings to committees to enable timely scrutiny of financial information. The Department of Education has not yet provided a budget briefing to the Education Committee, but is willing to do so next week. Uh, members, are you content to take that briefing next week? And are there any particular areas of budget you would like the Department to focus on? I have advised them the budget for next year. Um, members wish to comment on that item or agree that we take that briefing next week? Chair, can I come on? Yes, Karen. Yeah, I agree on the briefing next week. I would also like to know what bids um, that they are uh, providing in relation to COVID and any um, extra money there will be. Okay. Thank you. Get that okay? Yes, yep. Thank you. Any other members wish to add to that? I think, I think, Chair, just as well, just generally slightly off point, the, the, the look at, looking at the numbers that I've seen on the budget uh, allocated to education is very, very worrying, very poor, uh, given the challenges that education faces uh, the, this year uh, and obviously next year. Uh, so I, I have quite a few questions for the department next uh, week in relation to that. The only other department that uh, ended up worse was infrastructure. So uh, I'm very worried about the education department, given the demands on it and also uh, the support that is needed for teachers and children and schools. 
Yes, Daniel, I'd echo those concerns and have heard others echo them as well. Indeed, have heard many people refer to the uh, funding of education in recent years as more likely to limit children's opportunities than anything else. Um, so I think it is timely that we get that briefing uh, as a matter of urgency next week. Members content with that approach? Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you, members. Agenda item three is draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the Education Committee meeting of the 13th of January at page yes. 10 of your meeting packs and seek members' agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, agenda item four is matters arising. There are no matters arising. Any other members wish to raise any matters? No. Okay then, agenda item five members is our substantive briefing of today on the impact of COVID-19 uh, from the Northern Ireland Teaching Council and the Association of School and College Leader, Leaders uh, on school closures, examinations and other related issues. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a statement tabled from NAHT, a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 17, a briefing paper from the Northern Ireland Teaching Council at page 22, a briefing paper from the Association of School and College Leaders at page 27, an into position paper on public examinations 2020-21 at page 32, and can I welcome the following witnesses? Justin McCampbell, NASUWT, National Official, Northern Ireland, and uh, the Northern Ireland Teaching Council. Uh, Caroline McCarthy, Official at INTO, Irish National Teachers Organisation, and of the NITC. Miss Jackie White, General Secretary of the Ulster Teachers Union, of the NITC. Mark Langhammer, Regional Secretary, National Education Union, and NITC. Jackie Bartley, NAHT, and school principal at uh, St Genevieve's High School, NITC. Uh, Stephen Moore from the Association of School and College Leaders, and uh, Association of School and College Leaders President and Principal at Friends School, Lisburn. Mr Scott Naismith, uh, Association of School and College Leader, Executive Member and Principal Methodist College. Can I advise witnesses that the committee will give them three minutes each, uh, absolute maximum, uh, I'm going to have to be uh, speaker-esque in my time management today, um, given the uh, short time that we have available due to COVID uh, restrictions. Uh, th maximum of three minutes each to make an opening statement, which will be followed by questions from members, which can be answered across the panel of witnesses. And I'll, I'll do my best to um, make sure that we bring witnesses in when they, they want to answer questions and that I give us as fair an opportunity to do so as possible. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to keep the witnesses in the spotlight and to bring members into the spotlight uh, when they are asking questions? Um, witnesses, by, by way of welcome, can I, can I, on behalf of the Education Committee, um, thank you and all of the teaching staff and uh, non-teaching staff that you represent across Northern Ireland for the leadership and service that all your members have shown under extremely uh, and unprecedented, uh, extremely challenging and unprecedented circumstances throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I, I trust I speak on behalf of all members of this committee. Indeed, I would imagine all MLAs, um, when we say a very, very sincere thank you um, for the service that you and your members have given um, and recognition um, for the, the dedication um, that you've applied to our children and young people in Northern Ireland. So uh, thank you for, for everything that you have done and that you are doing at this time. Can I invite then Justin McCampbell to start us with our opening remarks today? Thank you, Justin. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the invite today. Um, I, I'm quite sure the teaching workforce are very appreciative of, uh, of your kind words today. Uh, on behalf of the NITC, uh, we have five unions here today who are going to uh, separately lay out what 
their position is on the different issues. Those issues include vaccinations, at special schools, the transfer test, at GCSE and A levels, uh, and uh, this, the whole issue around uh, school reopening and how uh, the situation has been handled to date. Uh, I'm going to address the issue around vaccinations. Um, we are calling uh, for all teachers and education staff to be prioritised uh, for the coronavirus vaccine. We believe this measure will save lives, but it will also help get children uh, back to school uh, safer and sooner uh, than they would, they would otherwise. Um, the current restrictions and the closures that we've had have been necessary, but they've also been, uh, been regrettable. Uh, teachers are doing the best to deliver the curriculum online, but that is never going to replace face-to-face uh, -face teaching. Uh, to have face-to-face -face teaching restored, we need mitigations in place, and Mark will be outlining those in, in his contribution. Uh, but we also need to recognise the clear evidence that teachers and education staff are at higher risk of contracting uh, coronavirus. Uh, we have found through evidence that has been released in England that teachers and school staff are between three and four times more likely to catch uh, coronavirus uh, than other adults in their local area. It's therefore important that uh, teachers uh, and all school staff are prioritised. But within the rollout of the vaccine, there's one group of teachers who are particularly at risk, and that's uh, teachers and school staff within the special school sector. Uh, within the special school sector, we have a big crossover uh, with health in terms of uh, the function of the schools and some of the things that uh, are carried out. Two metre or social distancing, or indeed one metre social distancing, just doesn't happen uh, within special schools. We have many young people who can't socially distance, uh, who can't wear face masks. Um, so we believe, therefore, that it's right and proper uh, that teachers in special schools are treated in the same way as all those who work within uh, health and social care, uh, as they are putting themselves at high risk uh, for, the, for, for the greater good and to ensure that uh, vulnerable young people uh, have respite. Uh, as, as, as I said at the start, schools will need to reopen, and it's important that they reopen uh, safely and without further disruption. We have to learn the lessons uh, from what has happened to date, but we also need to make sure that we have proper and tough uh, control measures in place. If we prioritise uh, the vaccine, everyone uh, within education will be back at work quicker and more safely. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Okay for me to bring in uh, the other NITC members in no particular oh, yes. order. Yep. Uh, can I invite Caroline McCarthy from INTO? Hello, Caroline. Hello. Thank you very much again for the invite today. Um, I'm going to be speaking to you about special schools. The issue remains that special schools are open and DE and EA have no idea of the mitigation that is required to keep them safe. Their suggestions often show a lack of understanding of special education and the estate that these children are in. The concerns of parents were not solely related to educational loss, but on the mental health and well-being of not just their child, but in some cases the family as a whole. Conversations have to be focused on the reality of the situation and not the assumed. While DE refer to meeting with the strategic leadership, with unions, there is limited, if any, action that's coming out of these meetings. I welcome the challenge to the Minister and his department by the members of the Education Committee, most recently on the 13th, and I thank you on behalf of my colleagues in special schools. At that meeting, the Minister called for a drill down into the issues and specific suggestions. Here are seven points. First of all, the Minister we to deliver a message that schools are a last resort in line with the wider executive directive. His expectation, as stated on the 13th, was that parents would choose to keep their children at home to be safe is in conflict with his message that special schools remain open to all children, including those with extreme clinical vulnerability, and creates the unpredictability that special schools are severely challenged by daily. 
We ask for Minister Weir to write to all principals of special schools and publicly endorse supporting their operational direction for the decisions they are making through risk assessment and the additional mitigations they identify to be implemented, including controlled and predictable reduction of numbers and day length, while maintaining access for all pupils who need the school environment. Third one is the guidance. A special schools are functioning on guidance that was written on the 24th of August. That was when schools were all reopening. That was when we were seeing a reduction in the uh, transmission rate within our communities. We are sitting with the same guidance, the same risk assessments from the EA. Fourth one, the vaccine to be delivered to the special school workforce, which Justin, ha Justin has outlined. Identified for care workers as a category of the vulnerable, a workforce of approximately 3,000 from the collection at the start of the day to the drop-off. It's important to also realise that our colleagues within the special schools who provide um, uh, direct payments provision, which may just be for a couple of hours a month, are already identified as being on the list for vaccination, and yet those that are working with children day in, day out are not. Um, the fifth, to improve the PPE, this was addressed specifically at your meeting. The PPE that is available is through procurement at the EA. Concerns have been raised specifically with aprons and gloves, and nothing has been done yet to change that, with the response coming back that they're medical grade. They may well be. The fact of the matter is they are not providing the protection that they need to. They are easily ripped and torn. It needs to be addressed urgently. It should be a simple matter for correction. The sixth is schools must work to reduce the number of contacts during the day. Actions need to be realistic, purposeful and prompt by DE and PHA. Many staff in school are concerned about the safety and message from PHA directly to them would serve a great benefit to the entire system. Risk assessments provided by the EA are quite frankly unrealistic. Um, I'll not go into that. And um, finally, what I would say is that colleagues in special schools are concerned about the safety for everyone within the school community. The Minister and, and the Department have not been producing mitigating steps that are implementable. A two-metre rule is not realistic, should not be repeated, and should be uh, reflective of the environment that is going on. Our principals and our teachers within schools and our support staff need their backing now. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Can I invite Jackie White of the uh, Ulster Teachers Union? Thank you, Chair, and thank you again for the opportunity to attend. I would just like to take a few moments to address one of the other key issues um, that's faced more primary principals and teachers at that time, and that's the transfer test. And we've had some reference made to that um, earlier. I understand there were invitations um, issued and so on. Primary school principals and teachers and their representatives have been calling now for some time, as you're aware, for a contingency plan in regard to academic selection. We all accept and acknowledge that this has been a contentious issue for many years, but I can assure the committee that in this context, this call was not grounded in ideology, but rather in general concern for the health and safety of our children parents and the wider community regarding the plans in place to sit the test in the midst of this current stage of the pandemic. It's highly regrettable that ideological differences stood in the way of actually focusing on a resolution for the children. And to commend Mr Butler, MLA, for his efforts to resolution. The admissions criteria where we've moved to now and we know the patterns of cancellation and rescheduling and the difficulties that that has caused, but the admissions criteria now are being redesigned and primary school principals are being left in a very, very difficult position. Uh, we've been hearing recently that they, they are finding many questions from um, parents that they, they can't answer because they have no clarity. They have had no direct uh, contact made by AQE to tell them what's, what way the, the move forward is. And they have had, some have had letters from some schools, some have had no information from schools at all. So they have absolutely no clarity and they are at a loss as to how to advise parents how to proceed. They're also very concerned about the role that they may be asked to play in any academic selection process. And we're all aware that the issues around the data held in primary schools have already been well rehearsed, but nonetheless, Important, but I briefly address the, the key concerns. Primary schools don't hold the type of data that we were able to employ for the post-primary schools when they come into a similar position. 
primary schools hold informative data and data that, that enables them to move forward with their teaching. So the standardised tests that they carry out inform teaching and learning, and they were not designed for the purpose of um, selecting or comparing children. Different schools use different tests, and some, due to the pandemic, have not been able to complete tests with this cohort since year five. Whether the data held pertains to year five or year six, we can assume that efforts have been made, obviously, to address the gaps in the learning, and the children will, not, will now be in a different place. So this data is not comparable and not reliable in this context. Then we've got the practice test papers. They're used in different schools at different times. Difficulties are that they're now commercially available and many have been completed outside of normal practice test conditions. They're employed by schools and marked by schools in different ways, particularly regarding the pandemic and the working outside normal practice. And this means that that data is not comparable or reliable. And of course, the internal tests in schools just serve the needs of the individual school and they cannot be used. Primary schools, particularly principals and year seven teachers, have worked incredibly hard, and I'm sure that was widely recognised, to support year seven children through this process to date. And the impact on emotional and mental health for both children and staff has been significant. Primary schools will provide data about an individual child to their parent if requested. That's what they're obliged to do, and that's what they will do, as I said, on request from a parent. But so some primary schools have been asked to, for example, rank order children or you know, supply data to schools or whatever. And that would be, it's our position that that's very unfair to ask them. In fact, they cannot engage in that process in that way. Um, we have left our primary school principals and our year seven teachers in the situation. And we need very quickly to seek a solution to this for the good of these young people in this cohort. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Mark Langhammer, Regional Secretary of National Education Union. Hello, Mark. Um, hello, Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I, I want to uh, briefly talk talk about the the school reopening in presumably February. Uh, I guess the last time I was in front of this committee, uh, the only thing that's really changed is that we're a bit clearer about the science. Um, we've been following people like uh, Professor Paul Hunter at East Anglia, uh, Jonathan Ball, the virologist at, at Nottingham. Uh, we're aware of the pretty vast 85,000 strong uh, study from Princeton University. Uh, and we're also aware, obviously, of the UK SAGE report in late, in late December. So the conclusions from all of that seem to be, firstly, that children are less affected than adults. Uh, with, the, with the writer that, the Harvard study by Hanage is saying that chief medical officers across the developed world probably understate the degree of child infection because by default they they count all home infections from adult to child. But generally speaking, children are less affected. Uh, secondly, notwithstanding that, children are very good incubators and spreaders of the virus. Uh, and thirdly, Broadly speaking, there is a clear link between closing schools and controlling the virus. And I refer you to the graph published by our own Northern Ireland Department of Health. I think it was published on the 11th of January, but the data was up to the, the 8th of January, which is very clear in that. So drawing conclusions from that, what do we do coming forward? Um, you know, obviously we all want to get back to normal as soon as possible, both in schools and, and in the wider society. but. We have a vaccination program on the way, and hopefully, touch wood, the weather will change. Um, so we're talking about a window of two or three months here. We think, uh, first of all, that there must be, there should be many fewer people in schools. In particular, we think class sizes should be significantly lower. We think the, the Danish um, ratio of one to 10 may not be achievable. But we should be looking at 1 to 12, something like that. So smaller class size is the first thing. Second thing is um, we are at a, a one meter social distancing in theory in schools. As Caroline said, it's very, very difficult to actually police. 
Um, we should be moving to a, you know, with the new variant, we should be moving to a two meter uh, social distancing. And in fact, some of the scientists are telling us now it should be three meters, but anyway, uh, more strict social distancing. Um, and the third thing that we need is, is to revisit the concept of protective bubbles. Now, protective bubbles are a bit like a fire break. Um, in most of Europe, you have protective bubbles of six or eight. And that means whenever you get a, a live case identified, that you know, maybe five, six or seven children are sent home. Now, by doing what we do, which is counting a full class of 25 or 30, or a full year group of up to 200, uh, you're creating chaos in schools. Uh, you, you, you can't send 199 kids home. Now, what actually happens is that, that, is that the principal spends a lot of time, administrative time, sorting through the 199 to see who the close contacts are. And talking to our principals, you're looking at maybe six hours to 10 hours work for a single case. So there's a lot of administrative burden. So that's, that's what we'd want, really. We'd, we'd want smaller class sizes, we'd want uh, re-established social distance, and we'd want uh, smaller protective bubbles. I think if the one thing that we could do uh, in respect of the assembly to ask for is to, f is to include schools in your focus uh, on the main thing. The first order priority here is to save lives. Uh, we'll, we'll go on today to talk about special schools and the transfer test and GCSEs and all manner of important issues, but actually in perspective, they're only really third order issues. The main order issue is to save lives in schools and in the society. Um, so I think that's, that's really all I want to say, Chair. Um, okay, thanks, you know, for, for, the, for the reopening of schools, we need to look at class sizes, we need to look at bubbles, we need to look at social distance, and it is temporary. Vaccination's on the way, the weather's changing, we're looking for a window to go in hard, and we get absolutely the centrality of schools to opening the economy and people going to their work. Uh, okay. We just think that, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. If I can bring in Jackie Bartley of NAHT. Jackie. Jackie there. Jackie, I think you might be on mute, sorry. <laughs> Still can't hear you there. Can you hear me now, Chair? That's us now, yep. Okay. Okay. Thanks good, very much. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity for speaking this morning. Um, um, NAHT, um, we have been asking the Minister, I, I'm going to speak about the examination situation. Uh, we've been asking the Minister to introduce contingency planning measures really since the start of last term. And um, we have produced two details plans and policy papers. Uh, with suggested mitigations uh, from the outset and you know our members had expressed a lot of willingness to engage with the department uh, and the minister to find workable solutions um, and I think that if the minister had listened to uh, school leaders um, and put out realistic measures in place uh, we wouldn't be in this place of uncertainty that we're in today. But NAHT met with SEA last week and, and we're very happy with the uh, direction of their proposals. But of course, that uh, rests on ministerial approval. And I think the frustration with schools at the moment is that lack of clarity and the timing around the urgency of uh, both our pupils and our teachers in knowing what is actually going to happen for this summer series. Um, many of our members have expressed concerns really the, about our pupils, pupils feeling demoralised and that act, it, the, the whole emphasis around that uncertainty is really having a detrimental effect on their health and wellbeing and we're very concerned about that because those young people have to be prioritised now and that clarity has to come very quickly. Um, and, and we as school leaders and as school teachers, in, in, we, we're there to support our children pastorally, uh, but we need answers, so we do. But we are concerned that there has been no, um, no cancellation of the BTEC examinations, and I think that we would urge the Department of Education to engage quickly with the Minister for the Economy on this matter, because many of our schools offer the BTECs 
in addition to both the GCSEs and the A levels, and we feel that these students also need to be treated equitably. So um, I think there's a matter of urgency in making sure that we know what's happening for our young people and for our teachers, um, and that that's done with with urgency, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Okay, can I invite uh, Stephen Moore from uh, the Association of School and College Leaders, President of the Association of School and College Leaders. Very welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much, Chairman. Can I just ask, uh, we've had technical difficulties getting off from C2K here in school, so I don't know if my colleague Scott Naismith is here with us as well, is he? It looks uh, like I'm on the phone. He is, yes. You're on the as well. Um, so, and I, I, we kind of missed the beginning of the meeting as well, so you, you want us to speak? To everything that we are that we're presenting today at the moment, is that correct? Yes, I've I've given <coughs> I've tried to give members approximately three minutes uh, to make opening yeah. statements. Um, so you, okay. if if you if you yourself and Scott are made it, are, are speaking, that'd be three minutes each. If you want to pull that together and one of you speak, I'm I'm content to do that as well. Whatever whatever's well, best for you, Stephen. Yeah, I'll maybe ask Scott to speak first of all, just about uh, um, school closures, and then I'll come in and speak a little bit about. Examinations and priorities for exams. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Scott. Um, thanks very much. Uh, 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 good morning, and I thank you again for this opportunity. Um, obviously, the government's aim is that schools are fully reopened after the February half term holiday. Whether or not that's possible clearly will depend on the coronavirus infection rates and the pressure on the NHS. Now, uh, like everyone else, we look forward to public health guidelines being able to confirm that it's safe for pupils, staff, and the community for schools to reopen. But it's important that when they do so, it's only when it's absolutely safe to do so. Uh, and that everything possible is done to keep them open, keep them safe and keep disruption in the future to an absolute minimum. And that's why we are supporting the calls for education staff, all education staff in schools, to be prioritised for vaccinations as soon as possible. When it's safe to do so, the best place for the young people is in school. The mental health benefits for the pupils, the parents and staff is clear. Uh, and it gets them back on, on the road to normality. But in preparation for this, schools would welcome further guidance on any mitigation measures that could be put in place in addition to those already deployed in order to make schools as safe as possible, and that obviously includes prioritisation for, for uh, the vaccine. We laud all of our staff who work exceptionally hard in extremely challenging circumstances to provide enriching, productive and supportive learning environments. I must give an excellent response from teachers and providing for the different needs of pupils to the blend of learning approaches and personal care. And they should be commended for their industry, their flexibility and their resilience. But it's better for the pupils, it's better for parents, it's better for everyone if we could get the pupils uh, back into school as soon as possible. There's a learning deficit that's building up and that learning deficit uh, needs to be closed. And if the uh, minister is looking at a phased return then priority should be given to those pupils in the years 12, 13 and 14. Uh, this will allow schools to uh, conduct assessments and control conditions that will inform the awarding of grades and continue, importantly continue with the learning that will equip them with the knowledge and skills that will allow them to move to their next level of learning. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Stephen? Thank you, Chairman. If I can just come in now and speak uh, to exact terms as well as statements earlier, but we realise that the solutions that are offered in the autumn term are no longer viable for the exams as they've now been cancelled. So I think what we're saying here is we need to ensure that there's integrity in the system and that we would avoid the pitfalls of last year. That doesn't mean that we can't build on some of the lessons that we learned from last year or that we throw everything out because I think that there are valuable things there that we can think about. But the system for this year needs to be as fair as possible and to recognise the different experiences of pupils across a range of schools. And we have to recognise as well that schools have all been affected in different ways. We need SIA and the department to be clear from the outset about the parameters within in which schools will operate when, and build on the good practice that's been identified in schools across the last year to ensure that there's proper guidance and that there's proper support in place as well. We need flexibility for schools with whatever suggested so that there is an element there where schools can choose and make sure that what they do in terms of any assessment tools that are offered will be suitable for the pupils in those schools. I think we also have to be aware that there could be unintended consequences of internal assessments, uh, that we recognise that whatever we put in place is a challenge because it will be high stakes for pupils. We have to realise as well that the GCSE cohort, for example, might not have done any formal exams in the school setting 
since last January. So we can't expect them to come straight back into school after a closure and make some formal assessment. One of the things I was looking at is that uh, by the time we get to February half term, we will have had 18 weeks of school closure. And the school year is 36 weeks. So you can see that these people over the course of their GCSE course have lost half a year's schooling and that's, that's assuming that we'll be back after half, half term, which looks increasingly unclear. We also have to be careful as well that we don't distort assessment and, and that we don't rule out using that as a learning tool. And sometimes when things are high stakes then that affects people both in terms of their anxiety and also their ability to learn from what they're doing. I think we need to give priority to teaching and learning, as Scott said as well, to make sure that pupils are as far as possible ready for the next stage in their learning, that we don't obsess just about grades, but that we make sure that we make up for that learning deficit. Um, we need to understand that given pupils' grades in this context is not the same as saying that they've reached a particular standard, so we'll have to make allowances for that as pupils transfer to the next stage of their education. We also have to recognise, I think, that it's not possible for us to be covering the Parent strategy, and that needs to come early for the 2022 cohort who will be sitting exams next year. We need an appeal system that is clear, and the details are published in advance. And we need an appeal system which doesn't leave school leaders and teachers exposed. And I think another point that we would make as well is that it wouldn't be acceptable for schools to be involved in dealing with appeals in July. We're also aware that there are particular concerns around S exams. Um, the difficulties I think that we need to take into account this year is that uh, processing grades for those will be very time consuming and stressful for teachers. The awards, since they've been decoupled from A-levels, uh, won't count for anything in most cases. And if we have to conduct any kind of assessment to determine those grades, then we need to make uh, sure that we realize that that involves an opportunity cost in terms of learning, and it's not necessarily the best use of time. And we do recognise, however, that some pupils will need AS grades, so that's something that uh, we might take into account as well. I think that's pretty much where we are in terms of the paper that we have submitted. Um, I know that there are a couple of other things that maybe will come up later on as well, but uh, that's where we are at the moment. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Um, and just to uh, check, Stephen Scott, you might not have heard my opening remarks, but. Um, I just took an opportunity on behalf of the Education Committee and, and I would trust all MLAs in thanking um, the organisations represented today and all your education sector staff that are members in your organisation for the, the leadership that you have shown in the response to COVID-19 and the, the dedication and, and service that <coughs> you've given to all children and young people in Northern Ireland during these exceptionally challenging times. So we thank you for that. Thank you, appreciate that. Okay, can I, I move to members' questions then? And can I start by bringing in the Deputy Chairperson, Karen Mullen, MLA? Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> thank you everybody for attending. And like the Chair, I wanna express my thanks to all your members. And I also want to express my thanks to the non-teaching members who are not represented here today, also who are keeping our schools open um, and everybody is going over uh, and beyond. So thank you very much. Um, everything that you have raised here today, we have also raised, I have raised my party, the, this committee has raised every single issue for weeks. So um, you would have probably heard the briefing last week. So um, I just have some statements and then I think I just have maybe two questions at the end. Um, in relation to the vaccinations and Justin had outlined it, I find at this stage it's absolutely beyond acceptable that we are sitting this week and we don't have a confirmed plan around uh, all school staff being added to the priority vaccination list and that we don't particularly even at this stage have started the vaccine for our special school staff. We raised that last week with the Minister. We continue to raise it um, at the various levels um, on a daily basis. And it is just, as I say, beyond acceptable. Um, so on Charlene, uh, in relation to special schools, again, I totally frustrated. Um, and last week I had raised with the Minister around engagement and planning with special schools. 
was told that the department had met with special schools on Friday, the 8th of January. Um, again, I didn't find the answer acceptable, as you outlined, and I would agree. Um, there's certainly a lack of understanding of our special schools. And again, it's very disappointing to be here another week later and hear from yourselves in relation to the out-of-date guidance and the support and the resources and the mitigations not being put in place. <coughs> Jackie, um, uh, Jackie White, Jackie, I, I, I actually do have a question for yourself. Um, I was just wondering, um, Jackie, because you've raised transfer tests, are you aware of some school bringing children into school next week to sit end of year assessments? Um, uh, for myself at the minute, I think that that would be put against public health guidance. Um, just, are you aware of that? I can't. I actually can't know. That hasn't been, I've uh, been contacted by quite a number of principals over various issues, but I have not had that raised. I can say that you know. talking about primary schools or? Yeah, primary school, the primary school is bringing in for the end of uh, primary seven, end of year assessment, they're saying, and they're actually putting them on next week physically to split the test. And they're assuming that that's going to move forward in some way towards it it will help with the grant entrance to a grammar school. So I'll, I'll actually, Jackie, uh, I'll say it all to you, Jackie. Yes, I'm, 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 Karen, Justin. Can I come in, Matt? I mean, I haven't been made aware of it either, Karen. But I would say it's more than a breach of guidance because the minister has used the COVID Act now to think it's the continuation order. I think this is a criminal matter. And if the people are aware of it, uh, they should be pursuing it with the appropriate authorities. Yeah. I mean, we, it's, a public, it's going to be a public health disaster if it is. Yeah, we wrote to the minister yesterday, Justin, when we were made aware of it. We actually sent on the letter, so we will follow up on that. Um, it's, it's only one school that I've been aware of, and obviously you sent it today. Um, <clears throat> Stephen and, and Scott, uh, I suppose looking at the papers around examinations, I see across the different unions, there is a difference of opinion. Um, uh, it may be a slight difference of opinion in terms of examinations. So it just shows how difficult it's going to be in relation to getting an agreement if we don't have an agreement even across our teaching unions. But um, in relation to your own paper, uh, Stephen, you said outlined um, around the appeals process last year and that you felt that the events of last year damaged the confidence of school leaders um, and left people exposed. And I know, Stephen, you just touched on it. You did break up a bit. Can I ask you what recommendations, what changes would you recommend to put in place for, for this year? Well, well it's, it's quite early because we haven't yet received the information, the guidance that we need about what's going to happen with the assessments and how we're going to determine the grades yet but I think that what we need to do is from the outset we need to have very clear parameters so I think probably SIA um, can take on board some of the information that came through from last year and can make sure as well that uh, we are given that information in advance that the parameters are laid out very clearly for us and that we know what the appeals process is going to involve. I think last year what happened was that we were we, we took we participated in the system and we expected there to be safeguards there and then because of the uh, the way events took shape last year, those cards were no longer in place. So I feel that we just need something that's more robust, that's agreed up front. And we have a little bit more time this year to work those things through. As I say, I think we need to wait until the guidance is there so that we can examine that and see what that involves. And then I think we need to work together with all parties to make sure that we have something that we can we can all stand over. Thank you, Stephen. I agree. We do have more time this year, so we strongly would recommend to the department that they work very closely um, with everybody in relation to that. Uh, we certainly don't want to see the situation that happened last year, so let's hope we've, we, we have uh, learned the lessons where the department has. Thank you all very much, Chair. That's me. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Can I bring in uh, Robin Newton, MLA? Thank you, Chair, and I thank the members of the various unions uh, for, for being with us uh, today. Um, it's always very useful to, to hear the different perspectives. Robin, can I pause you for one second? Apologies. Um, 
Members and witnesses, you might want to make sure that you're on mute if you're not speaking. It just helps with background noise and helps to hear whoever is speaking a bit more clearly. Thank you very much. Sorry, Ron. Thank you. Okay, Chair, can I uh, start again and thank the uh, members of the various unions for being with us uh, today. It's always uh, good to hear the different opinions uh, around the table. Um, can I just start by saying that the, the, the committee fully agrees with the, uh, the bodies uh, on the need for vaccinations and in fact uh, we raised it uh, at the committee last week uh, that uh, it was our belief that those involved in the teaching profession at uh, all levels uh, should have been the priority. The committee agreed to write to the Minister on the matter and also to write to the uh, Health Minister on the matter and that that be taken to the Executive. My understanding is it's not in the gift of the Minister, either Minister, uh, to make that decision, but uh, hopefully a, a united, and I hope we would get a united front uh, at the Executive, uh, that that would be helpful uh, in uh, prioritising and hopefully uh, delivering uh, the, the, the message that uh, school teachers and staff uh, are our priority uh, and should be a priority in, in uh, the vaccination programme. Can I thank uh, uh, Mark Langhammer uh, for the very concise way and clear way that he laid out what uh, he sees as a pathway to a return uh, to, to schools? Um, thank Mark uh, for that. I have only uh, three short questions, if that is uh, fine with you, Chair, yep. and which I would really just uh, put out, and then whoever wishes to react uh, to the questions. Uh, the first one is on, on, on special schools, and perhaps uh, the question might be just around what would be needed uh, to ensure that our special schools um, can open safely, that would have the confidence of the staff, the confidence of the, uh, the, the parents uh, in, the, in delivering their children uh, to the, the, the school. Uh, and uh, can I ask also about uh, whoever would like to comment on what advice the, the, the unions might give on and, and what might be the features within an alternative uh, to the transfer test as it's not uh, proceeding uh, this, this, this year. And indeed, uh, perhaps the uh, unions might uh, offer, in terms of advice to the executive as a whole, uh, what might be an outlined pathway that uh, the teaching unions uh, as a whole, could see uh, as a full return to, to school. Um, and I'm accepting that that's not uh, going to happen in the very near future. Chair, thank you. Thanks, Robin. Hey. Uh, maybe if my colleagues are happy enough, I could take the first part of that question with regards to special school. Um, I suppose maybe I went over it a little bit briefly, but I think that the fact of the matter is schools are already open. Schools, special schools have not been closed. They have um, endeavoured to sustain a safe environment um, since they reopened on the 4th of January with no um, updated guidance and no additional mitigations coming from DE and EA. Those have had to be put in place by individual principals looking at the risk assessments within their environments and that has been ma met with uh, in some instances public outcry as opposed to support and the Minister has remained very quiet in his support for those principles in taking those decisions that are essential for a safe environment. We really need the Minister to step up and support his principles publicly and support the staff who are in schools. He's been very silent, really, on what has been going on. There have been numerous meetings with the Department, with the EA and with PHA, both with my colleagues here today from an NITC point of view and also directly with the principals. And the actions that have come out of those have have been negligible, if any, and that has to change. Um, there is guidance that is setting that I said we are calling for to be rewritten 
to actually contain within it mitigations that are appropriate. When we met with the um, with the lead for the Department of Education COVID response team, they were kept on being a repetition of two meters social distancing. That is repeated in the most up-to-date risk assessments that are coming from the EA. There has to be acknowledgement that two meters social distancing is not possible with the children within these schools. It even talks about when they're coming off the buses at the start of the day. The vast majority of our pupils need support and guidance coming off, or at least somebody close in case of there being an incident, though independence is always encouraged. Um, the vaccination has been well covered today and talked about an improvement to PPA, and I think clarity of numbers from the PHA. Um, I was speaking to some principal members this morning and they were saying that the PHA had a meeting with them and shared directly figures within special schools. If there is positive information, then share it, because it's the lack of that that is causing anxiety for staff, that is leading to a crisis of staffing within many of our special schools, and that needs to be addressed. I think the, the, the key element has been when schools have looked for support, when principals have looked for support, it has not been forthcoming with any speed or consistency from those bodies that should be delivering it. And that, and, and that simply has to change. Um, all of us um, that are sitting here represent members within special schools. All of us have been hearing our concerns. We have been working very hard with the wider group of the Educational Trade Union group, which supports our non-teaching colleagues. As, um, as was pointed out earlier, they are a key, key player in the functioning of special schools as well. We are working very hard to push for safety in schools, but very often it is taking an awful lot of shouting for something that should be coming forward very, very easily. Okay. If schools are safe, they can be opened. Thanks, Caroline. Robin, do you want to... Uh, respond or, or repeat those other questions. I'll, 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 members, I'll, I'll try and give some latitude today with regards to the, the time limits, um, given that there may be a number of respondents to questions. And um, if members wish to, to come in um, further to other members asking questions at the end of their, at the end of that run of questions, then um, indicate to me, Robin. No, the second question really, Chair, was just about the uh, the uh, transfer test not going forward uh, this year, and indeed, what advice or what support or uh, what factors might need to be taken into consideration uh, as the position of the unions in terms of uh, a fair and equitable transfer to, to grammar schools. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'll maybe come in there if that's okay. Um, Justin, go ahead. Um, yeah, uh, and thanks for that uh, question, Robin. I, I think I would start with you know, the primary responsibility for this lies with the organisations who are responsible for transfer. And I do think it's an application of responsibility on their part that they haven't uh, appeared before this committee. Um, the unions have always said we are prepared to talk and work with anyone. Um, I know one of your colleagues, Mr. Butler, we had a very good meeting uh, with him last week around, around the plans he's putting forward. Um, our main concern uh, for what may happen is around primary school members, uh, who are either teachers or school leaders, uh, that they are not put in a position where they are effectively deciding uh, which school someone attends. Uh, schools do, primary schools do hold information that parents would receive uh, on an annual basis or when their child leaves the school. And we certainly would be advising our members if that's the information you normally provide, provide that information. Uh, but we would uh, caution that that information quite often is from formative assessments, which were used uh, to identify uh, learning that would be needed to bring teachers, sorry, to bring pupils up uh, to the required standard. And we would hope that means they've met the standard uh, by at the end of primary seven. Um, therefore, if teachers do provide that information, it, uh, it should be with the health warning that this is a formative assessment which not carried out necessarily under the same conditions uh, as um, the transfer test would be. Um, we know this is a difficult position, and I think we've all come at this uh, from the position of the test has to be cancelled for health concerns. That doesn't mean we're uh, not stepping away. We do have, most unions have a position um, against selection, 
Uh, however, in this for this year, health has to come first, and that okay. has to be the priority in working out what happens this year. There okay. will be a debate down the line. My view is that debate should wait until post-COVID, but others may have a different view. Okay. Does anyone else wish to come in and respond Chair, to if I could, if I could come in to in respect of of Robin's third question, which was, what would it? We just lost your audio there, Mark. Sorry. You hear me now, Chris? You can yes. Yeah, it's in it's in respect of the question about a, a full return to schools. Obviously, I spoke earlier about mitigations in the meantime, uh, and largely, uh, uh, largely, we're in the hands of the medics and the scientists. But I would suggest maybe two sort of measures that that you might look at. Uh, one is the vaccination of staff, which has already been mentioned. And the second would be that the that the R rate would be at a, a reasonably low level for a sustained period. Now, I don't want to get any more specific in that. You know, it might be 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, that sort of ballpark for a sustained period. But I think all of us, uh, we don't want to be doing the opie cookie with schools, where schools are you know in for a few weeks and then out for a few weeks, etc. Uh, so I think. Vaccination plus the R rate at a sustained low level okay. for a time. You know, that, that's the best I could do. Sorry. Okay. Thank, thanks, Mark. Um, and we'll just encourage us all to, to stay as concise as we can in our, our questions and our, our answers and responses. Robin, content with those responses? Content, sure. Thank you, Robin. Okay. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan, MLA? Thank you. Daniel. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just Starley took away the unmute me there. Um, th thanks to our uh, guests today at the committee and for the very important information that they have shared with us. They have echoed the concerns that we've been hearing day and daily from uh, schools and from SEM schools and, and, and parents right across the entirety of Northern Ireland. Our inboxes are full uh, and we appreciate the seriousness of the challenges that are being faced during this pandemic. Uh, the NITC has outlined uh, three options in relation to the operating of special schools at, at this time. And may I say I share the concerns uh, that have been expressed about the Minister's approach to keeping special schools open with the very limited range of mitigations to keep staff and pupils safe that are currently in operation. We've raised this, we raised this prior uh, to the Minister's announcement of reopening special schools and we sought guarantees of protections, mitigations or resources to ensure that schools can be safe and that staff can be safe in those environments. Uh, particularly doing the great work that they're doing in supporting vulnerable children. I'd suggested to the Minister long before special schools reopened that a safe, safety working uh, party to be set up comprised of staff in special schools and safety experts from the PHA to look at the particular context special schools operate in with a view to bringing forward fresh recommendations. Now, the Minister's, the Minister's acknowledged that's a good idea and has done nothing about it. It is also public knowledge that I'm in favour of priority vaccination. The SDLP have called continually for the vaccination of all school staff, particularly given they've been exposed to uh, the large numbers of children and young people and have been at significant risk. They've been doing a fantastic job throughout this pandemic in very difficult and challenging circumstances. Uh, if they're good enough to be in the classroom and doing that great work, they're good enough for the vaccine and should be prioritised uh, immediately in relation uh, to that. Uh, I've just a, a, a number of questions, so I'm, I'm going to jump into the transfer test. I've listened to uh, some of the responses th that you have gave in relation to the transfer test, and uh, I acknowledge that, that there's no easy or quick fix solution to this problem, uh, but uh, had the Minister and AQE and PTC uh, uh, have acted sooner, uh, then we may have had a more clear contingency and children would have had a bit more certainty uh, as to the process. So uh, I'm just wondering, what do you see as the fairest way of doing primary transfer? Because we've heard uh, that uh, post-primary transfer this year will be done on the basis of social selection. Uh, some have claimed. So I'm just wondering, I've, I've heard of the ways we shouldn't do it, but I'm just wondering what the suggestions are for the unions as to the fairest way, in their opinion, as to how we should do it. Well, I, I'm happy to come in there, Daniel, because I had I had addressed it in the first place. Um, but I think what we're seeing in the, in the light of this pandemic 
we're, and, and also actually in other years, whenever we don't have a pandemic, is that schools use a range of criteria in order to admit children. Now, some schools and many schools, in fact, who would normally use academic selection have chosen this year to go a different route. And I think in order to make it fair, if we're looking at fairness, and if some schools are taking that out of the equation and bearing in mind that the data held, as has been referenced before, data held in the primary schools is not robust for that kind of purpose. And also to try to, um, well, we've shown we can't get data because there's a public health risk. So probably the fairest way forward is for all schools this year to, to take a step back, to revisit their criteria and to leave that to the side and to revisit it at a later date, whenever we're actually in a position where that conversation can take place with health issues resolved. Okay. Anyone else? No. No. I'm um, sorry, Daniel. Yeah, I, I think part of the problem is that we're dealing with a system that's not fair to begin with. So how do you design a, 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 a fair uh, backup plan? I think it's something that's, that's impossible. We are operating with the, acknowledge we're operating with the system we have. It's not necessarily how we'd all like it to be. Uh, but I go back to my point that those in charge of selection and the minister have failed young people by not dealing with this uh, and at putting contingencies in place. The responsibility uh, lies with them. I've been very clear about that and consistent with that in my criticism of the Minister and his failure to act at an earlier stage and also his uh, continuing uh, uh, passing the buck exercise and not taking responsibility showing leadership that children have been hanging in the balance and I'm, I'm conscious that the system is not fair and I'm also conscious that in the, the circumstances of this year uh, it, it, it has been uh, circumstances have been worsened because there hasn't been sufficient action or leadership shown uh, by the minister. I'm just wondering, has there been any conversations with ASCO, and what are their, uh, what what are they suggesting as the as the best way forward? Okay, can I, can I maybe come in on that one then? Um, to, just ASCO Northern Ireland draws its membership from all types of post primary schools, and consequently, uh, the association doesn't have a position on transfer or academic selection. We're confident, however, that our members will always do what they believe to be the best sense of the young people, and that's where we're at at the moment. Um, basically, um, with no transfer tests uh, and the Minister's extension to the deadline for the publication of criteria, uh, Boards of Governors are back looking at their uh, admissions criteria, giving due consideration uh, to the guidance published by Denny, and it will be for Boards of Governors to make uh, the, the decision um, based on that guidance um, and what they think is in the best interest of the pupils. Um, and you know, we're confident that all our young members will act on behalf of our young people uh, and that Board of Governors will okay. come to wise and correct uh, decisions. Yeah, but, okay. I have, a, I have another question for Asko. The, the, the 2021 exams have now been cancelled and we're turning to centre assess grades, a position that I have shared for quite some time, uh, with some form of CA-led moderation, uh, which we are not aware of what that is yet. I note that ASCO is seeking a solution that is pupil-focused, teacher-led and data-conditioned. I would like to ask um, whether uh, you could elaborate on your proposition. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the use of the term data conditioned. Uh, what is meant by that? Uh, one of the statements I have read, uh, I heard repeatedly by teachers uh, of exam class this year is we have less data than last year to base our judgments on, which is due to the pandemic. What's more, the data schools have come from uh, a background of disrupted learning due to sickness, self-isolation and school closures that are not consistent across schools or even subject areas. <coughs> so if you could elaborate on your on your proposition, ask us proposition. I don't, I don't know if Stephen's still there. <laughs> Is Stephen still there, Chair? He might not be actually, Scott. I'm not seeing him on the line okay. here. That, that's, that, that's fine. I'll, I'll pick that one up then. Uh, in terms of what we're, we're talking about there, uh, is it's, it's the whole idea um, that uh, the, the grades that are awarded are informed. Now, um, looking at how other jurisdictions uh, have approached this and the discussions that are going on uh, across the water in England um, and the discussions we're having with SEA, uh, that they're looking at providing some form of assessment tools uh, so that they'll... Um, 
schools will have a menu, uh, if you like, of assessment items that they will be able to adapt. And that's the key thing here, that schools are given the flexibility to use what they consider to be the most appropriate uh, systems of assessment uh, that apply to the work done this year in school. Uh, given all the disruption that's happened to that work, uh, the variation across subjects and across schools in terms of coverage of the various syllabi. Uh, so it would, be, it would be very helpful and be very welcome if SEA did provide uh, some assessment tools. But we've got to be fully aware that as soon as that assessment tool is out there, uh, it's going to be public knowledge what it is and probably public knowledge uh, what, what the marking scheme would be. Uh, so staff would be able to use that in school selectively, but importantly, given uh, the flexibility, given uh, the, the uh, trust, uh, to use other uh, in-school uh, systems of uh, assessment as well. Uh, and as Stephen said earlier, uh, being able to differentiate clearly between those which are used to inform the award of a, a professionally judged grade and those that are used to uh, inform uh, learning needs going forward. Okay. You, you also state that the unintended consequences of the internal assessments that will now have to be undertaken is less uh, time to cover the full subject specifications that the Minister has requested. This being the case, have you any suggestions as to how the gaps in learning should be closed? I'm thinking particularly of subjects uh, such as maths, uh, where future learning is highly dependent on past understanding. Well, you're absolutely right, and that's, that, that, that's uh, again, trying to address that learning deficit and trying to give as much time as possible across to learning. Um, we're probably going to have our uh, year 12, 13 and 14 in school in, in sub-term, uh, whereas they've been out of school for exams, uh, and have been able to retain them in school and keep the learning going uh, beyond just the grades uh, and the information that is used to assess. I think that's the important thing. Uh, that we need to get across uh, uh, to pupils uh, and the parents that uh, the, the working schools are not just about getting these grades uh, so that they can, uh, or getting these assessments done so that they can award grades, uh, but that we'll be uh, continuing the learning as much as we possibly can to make up that learning deficit, even after the date in which those grades have to be submitted to the exam boards. Okay, Daniel, that's, that's time. If the you can draw your remarks to close, yep. Yeah, the very final point, Chair. Uh, what, what recommendations do you have? Uh, uh, around appropriate standardisation procedures at this time? Well, in, in terms of standardisation, uh, again, that's something we're, we're in discussion with the CEO with uh, about how that, that can be achieved. Uh, the standardisation practices that can be applied within schools. But obviously, uh, CIA as the awarding body, have got uh, uh, the overall responsibility as well for quality assuring grades. Um, so uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, the, the suggestions and the models that they may come up with uh, in order to help with that standardisation process. Okay. But we trust in the integrity of the profession here. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you to all our unions for the, the, the great work that you are doing and, and, and standing up and defending schools, particularly in the challenges that they face and with a minister that is clearly not listening to school leaders at this time. So well okay. done on all the work and efforts that you have done and uh, also thanks to our school staff and teachers out there that are working extremely hard as well. Thanks, Daniel. Can I bring in Thank Robbie you. Butler, MLA? Thanks. Yes, Chair. Th Thank you so much. Um, I don't know, guys, if it's my Wi-Fi signal at this side or whether it's at your side, but I'm, it's breaking up a little bit, and uh, I hope that uh, you will be able to hear and stay with me um, through this. I just want to thank each and every one of you, actually, for your um, input today. I want to thank the, the unions and rep bodies that met with me last week. Some of you guys are on here and for the conversation we had and the fair representation and the, and the, the fair way that you're addressing this um, in the absence of other people, perhaps with more uh, authority and clout, um, to do something for this cohort of P7 pupils with uh, AQ and GL. And I'm going to just go into that one, first of all, if that's okay, and there'd be no surprise there. Um, this is an exceptional year. I think everybody will accept that and, and certainly that has been taken on board by, by everybody. But what I'm what I will maintain throughout this this conversation today and everything I do is that we must treat this co this cohort of P7s in exactly the same way as we are treating our year um, uh, 11s, 12s, 13s and 14s. And fairness is the key here. Fairness is absolutely the key. We have circa 16,000 entrants to uh, GL and AQE who in good conscience uh, entered into a process and it's been sort of uh, cruelly ripped away from from them and it is not their fault. So I'm glad that uh, a number of people said we have to set aside the, the ideological argument and there is a discussion to be had there 
um, and we all need to be up for that discussion. Um, we've shown fantastic uh, uh, solution-focused ideas in around CCEA and the awarding of exams where we're looking at mitigations. The reality for me is this. Our P7 pupils didn't miss any more school or learning than our year 12s, 11s, 13s or 14s. It's exactly the same. They missed an equal amount of school. So in terms of, of what uh, needs to be done and, and the, crea the creativity that we need to show uh, needs to be there. Um, for those that possibly haven't uh, entered into the discussion, and I'm not talking about you guys, I'm perhaps talking about um, uh, some politicians possibly, um, uh, and the minister, would it be fair to apply the Department of Education's criteria to our year 11s, 12s, 13s and 14s and, and, su and suggest that we transfer them based on their geographical location or uh, the fact that they have a sibling or they don't. I don't think anybody would countenance it and we need to be as fair to our PCMs and be as creative. And I want to thank you guys. I, I know it's hard for a lot of people, but I, I want to thank you for being brave. I'm just going to ask some of the, the committee members also to, to, to think on that and I'm sure they'll pick it up with me uh, when you guys go. Um, I'm not going to talk about IQ anymore, guys, because you know my position. I wrote, wrote to, uh, sorry, I, I did a press release yesterday. I didn't write to the minister because I've written to him plenty. Um, I think that the minister needs to uh, invoke his coronavirus powers to do something uh, solution focused here and take the responsibility off teachers and schools. Because one of the things I think, um, Jackie had tried to answer it was the deputy chair that brought it in. One of the schools is possibly going to operate, out, operate outside the virus at the moment. I don't want to see any school doing that really really don't so we need to see leadership from the minister and the department here uh, and i want to see schools both primary and um uh, and secondary and, and grammar schools given that that cover um, i'm going, just going to actually spend Rob, the last Robbie, bit do, on, do you want to ask uh, a, do, do you want to ask a question yeah. in relation to that or are you moving on moving on sorry did, did you what this i'm just checking yeah. did you can you hear me you, yeah i'm just checking did you have a question on that or are you are you content to no you, no no okay. no i'm not going to ask you a question to be honest with okay. you these guys here, I've, I've spoken to at length, and I know their position, Chair, so I don't believe okay. to you if that's okay. Okay. Um, they, I'm just going to go on to something that was uh, at Mark Langhammer, Langhammer shared about reopening. I think that's really important um, because obviously there's going to be a lot of talk about the vaccinations, and I don't think there's anybody on this committee that would argue uh, against uh, vaccinations for teachers, especially in the realm of special schools at the moment. But obviously, we are following the medical and scientific advice. Um, there is the clinical vulnerability and there's the vaccine availability. And I hope and, and, and I will be um, communicating with my, 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 my party colleagues um, to ensure that uh, when that can be looked at with the JCVI guidance that, that, that this, uh, our teachers are indeed done. But, but Mark Langhammer, uh, and I think it was Stephen from Friends that offered up uh, alternative solutions too that we also must look at. And that's, I'm going to break it down into three words, time, distance and shielding. So in terms of opening our schools, I think there are other solutions that we need, we should look at. Um, from my chair, from my background in the fire service, again, keep using it. But when we were dealing with radiation and radiation risk, how we mitigated that was taking those things into consideration, reducing the time of exposure, maximising the distance, and then the maximum amount of shielding. And that's been covered. Um, I just want to maybe ask the guys there with regard to that. Um, there had been ideas muted before, and that was around using alternative venues. Um, utilising leisure centres, church halls and that type of thing. Um, have any of the unions and rep bodies got any um, strong feelings about that? Because I think it's a good idea, but obviously having not worked in the sector, I, I, I'm just trying to fish out if there are any issues with that. So I think the time distance shielding is an excellent idea, Mark. I see Justin is indicating there. So, um, yeah, sure, I, I, I just Thanks. end with that. Thanks, one. Justin. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, that was the original plan uh, from the 19th of June. Uh, however, the Minister decided towards the end of August that schools would come back in a full return. Uh, we remain convinced that uh, that was a mistake, uh, that the approach of having more space uh, could have been done. However, to utilise other buildings, you need more staff, and that, that's the reality. If you're taking a class of 30 and splitting it into two 15s, getting the building is probably the easy part getting the extra teacher, making sure that that building then gets cleaned, because it could well be have been used in the evenings for different things. Uh, that, uh, uh, for example, a caretaker can check that lighting, everything, etc., is as it should be. So yes, it could have been done. It would have cost money and resources. But uh, when we look at what's happening in the health service now, my view is that it would have been money well spent. <laughs> 
thank you for that, Justin. Um, with regard to the, the, a restart, I mean, I have a fear that if we don't do something, um, I get something in place uh, soon for uh, for looking at the midterm break, we'll possibly not be open until Easter. And I think that nobody here wants that, but it's a real, it's a reality. If we don't get the reassurances, the the, the, the contingencies and mitigations. Um, have you guys put anything forward in terms of a, an updated proposal with regard to what limiting the time and, and increasing the distance and increasing the the the, um, the protections would be? I mean, I think the union, uh, sorry, the, the committee have been quite strong on this in terms of the asks. I'll let Caroline go. I think those have, have been clearly shared. Every time guidance has come out, the unions, when they have been presented with it, have made suggestions to make it practical and input. Um, Justin refers back to the guidance that came out in June that schools prepared for, and then at the very last minute, that was um, whipped away and we were thrown into another uncertainty. I think it's about guidance being prepared now and discussed with unions um, in order to represent the workforce and how that can practically be put into place. When I talked about um, DE not really having an understanding of the special schools estate, they don't really have an understanding of the wider schools estate either. And while it may be um, that different venues will work for some, they won't necessarily work for others. So I think that the onus is really on DE to have a think about what budgets would be there to support any kind of steps forward and uh, present ideas that fit in with that. If I could come in, Robbie, I mean, to be absolutely explicit about this, I mean, we, we had, I'd, I'd said earlier the sorts of mitigations that we would like to see in terms of social distancing, uh, class sizes, uh, bubbles and so on, but the quid pro quo is what that really means, is that schools would be operating rotational systems, um, effectively, you know, some children in and some children out on any given day. So that, 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 that proposal was a for the meantime proposal until we get the R rate down and until with some confidence of a full school opening. So I just wanted to make that clear. Okay. Yeah, brilliant, Chair. Thank you very much. And guys, thanks for being solution focused. I mean, that's what we're about to thank me. Thanks, Robbie. Can I bring in William Humphrey, MLA? Thank you. Okay. Morning, Karen. Thank you. Um, morning, everyone. And thanks very much for your attendance, your evidence, and your answers so far. Um, I think what what is stark about all of this is that some of us were discussing yesterday. You know, we have lost eighteen weeks of the academic year for these young people, and that is something which is very serious. And we could be facing e even further delays uh, as the as the whole pandemic unfolds. Unfortunately, so that's something which we need to be extremely mindful about. Um, can I just reassure um, all of you, and uh, I think it was Mr. McCampbell raised the issue of the vaccinations. The Minister, when he was involved in the committee last week, the Minister has actually uh, made it very clear he's in support of those working in education being given, pri given priority in terms of vaccination. And as Robin Newton indicated, uh, you know, we, we agreed to write to the Minister last week, but, and I also proposed a letter go to the Health Minister, but ultimately, the, the decision around that is the Joint Committee on Vaccinations and Immunisation, and that's where the pressure needs to be applied. And I think what I, the point I was making at committee last week was that um, we need all of the education and health ministers across the UK, UK jurisdictions to make in that case, and I think that's what would be hugely important and helpful around that. Um, can I just, in terms of some questions, um, Mark, it was very interesting what you were saying about the three points of class size and social distancing and the protective bubbles. And I was wondering if you could expand on that. I know you didn't have much time, so if you could expand on what you were talking about there, because because that's interesting in terms of uh, kids potentially going back and the challenges that are going to be faced. Yeah, in terms of in terms of the the protective bubbles, I mean that was consciously adopted from the the Denmark um, way of working things, and and they limit their bubbles to to six. Now I likened it to a fire break, which is exactly what it is. So if you get a a, a live case in that bubble, the bubble of six, five go home. Um, now I think the way we've done it, we're <coughs> class, classes of twenty five or thirty 
or in, in many cases year groups of 120, 150 or 200 are, are deemed to be in a bubble uh, and you get a case, that, that brings an unnecessary amount of, of people, young people, into the mix. Uh, I'd suggest that we don't want to be sent in 199 home. Uh, so in practice, what principals do is that they, they spend a lot of time researching close contacts and the principals I've talked to, you know, can, can say that a single case could have them working six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours, depending on, on how many contacts. So I think we, we either, you know, shell the idea of protective bubbles and, and be strict on smaller class sizes. That's one way of doing it. But if we are going to keep the protective bubbles, we need to have them smaller. That, that, that's really all. Um, so all of those mitigations we talked about, uh, you know, they, these are interim solutions, these are mitigations, because you can't implement them without, without leaving some kids at home. You know, and, and Scott may be sort of better placed than I am to, to talk about the mechanics of that, but by and large, I mean, kids will be half in, half out, which is not what we want either. And knowing your constituency as you do, I mean, there's a lot of particularly concerned about the, the young people who are from disadvantaged backgrounds who seem to lose out most, who seem to have least access to home learning, and possibly, you know, very poor learning environments, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe chaotic homes in some places. So uh, this is not what we want. Um, but it, it, it's, it's temporary while the, while the new variant is, is sent the infection rate higher. Okay. Um, can I maybe then turn, Carolyn, you, you mentioned, I think, that the unions met with the Public Health Authority last week. Um, could I ask you, what was the outcome of that meeting and what, what assurances or reassurances were you given? Uh, public health, sorry, there was just one representative from the Public Health Authority with a broader meeting with DE and EA, and there was um, no specific reassurances given other than they felt schools were safe. What we're saying is that information needs to be shared on a broader scale. NITC have written um, last year to the CMO and CSO requesting a meeting with them, and there has been no acknowledgement of that letter from them and that's based on genuinely a drive to reassure the workforce that it is safe. It's fine to, to use those words with, without the facts and figures, they're not there. Like I said, I was speaking to um, principal members this morning and there was a meeting with the PHA, I believe yesterday or um, earlier in the week. And at that meeting, it was um, information was shared that was reassuring but that needs to be shared on a broader scale. This information is being kept very close to very close to the chest and that's not helping the situation within schools at all. So what I would say is if there could be published information coming out and if the request for meeting with the CMO and the CSO could be, um, could be accepted and brought forward as soon as possible, that would go some way to us actually being aware of what these figures actually are. Well, practically, and I think sharing that information is important, but practically, whose responsibility then, if this information that, that the principals were given yesterday was helpful, and, and you want to share it on a wider basis, and I think that would be absolutely sensible and the right thing to do, whose responsibility is that? I mean, did they give it to the union, the principals, for the principals to share it, or... Uh, yeah. But then you get into third-hand information. The key point mm. is it comes from the person who's delivering it. To me, yeah. the person who has gained that information so that they can be directly asked. Our principals are already, already handling increasing um, issues within their own school environments to then try and process down information and not have the background knowledge to be able to answer the very complex questions that the workforce are coming up with, understandably, because they are at the cold face of dealing with it. So I think it's for um, the, P the PHA to share on a wider scale information if the information is there. And the, 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 the question has gone to them and um, so far ha has, has not been um, replicated. Even if we look at the PHA support for schools that was running up to Christmas, I think when we got to Halloween, the extension very much bought time for the PHA because that school support service was crumbling under the pressure. 
that was happening. When we got towards Christmas, the same situation was happening again. When we reopen schools, broader than special schools, we're going to see potentially that same increase. There has to be a, a more... Um, a more open communication between PHA and the school system, trade unions and schools direct, um, if we're going to move forward in a safe and informed way. A lot of it is about information and information sharing. You know, coming as, as posing concerns and coming up with ideas and then hitting a brick wall is not solving this matter. Okay. Yeah, I think I agree entirely. I mean, I've consistently made the point at the committee and in the chamber that. Um, you know, information and the sharing of information, the communication of information is key. Mm -hmm. So if there if there has been um, poor sharing of information, that is just self defeating uh, in terms of giving the confidence uh, and the reassurance to school principals and those who work uh, across our school estate. So, Jerry, I think one of the things that following my line of question, I think we should be asking the public health authority at the senior level to be sharing this information that was given yesterday. Uh, right across the state, state to all principals and also we've also been told a number of occasions about meetings between uh, unions and the EA and the department those need to be meaningful meetings with outcomes and outputs and again sharing of information so I think some correspondence from us of the committee uh, to the PHA and to the department and the EA around that about that information and getting the information out there because it is crucial that would be important. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, me. thanks, William. Can I bring in uh, Nicola, Nicola uh, Brogan, MLA? Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Nicola. And again, thanks. Thanks to everyone and to all the witnesses for coming here today and for your presentations. Um, initially, I'd just like to agree, Justin, I think everyone's touched on this now, but what Justin said about the vaccinations, obviously that um, it's so important and we agree that, or I agree, that all school staff should be prioritising the rollout of vaccinations and um, including staff of childcare facilities. So we've all been raising this and will continue to raise that there issue. Um, it's obviously a big factor in the technical schools reopened and to keep them open. Um, Jackie Bartley, you'd mentioned or you raised the issue of BTEX. Um, I agree with you that it's not fair or acceptable that the street has any kind of clarity on this issue yet and that the ministers of education and economy haven't worked together and with their own bodies to um, cancel the BTEX yet. It's, you know, it's failing our young people and they, do, they need that reassurance to instead of left and limbo. The other issue I wanted to touch upon was um, I I have written a letter to Minister Weir about the, um, IT equipment and remote learning um, and the fact that so many families don't have access to the equipment they need for remote learning, um, including the broadband. You know, I'm um, in a rural constituency in West Rome, and so many of uh, my constituents have trouble with that there. Um, but following on from that there, we know that in this period of restrictions, there are so many more students physically attending school. Um, compared to the initial period in March. Do you believe that there are sufficient support and um, resources and staff available within schools to continue from effective remote learning as well as in-class learning? And if not, what do you think is required to make this possible? Anybody can answer that? Okay. Okay, I don't mind answering that question. Um, we are um, at the moment, um, and I think you've highlighted one point, uh, the whole area of, of our vulnerable children who are coming into school on a daily basis. And I think one of the, 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 the things that the members of our union have highlighted are the fact that support services still need to be in place for those pupils. Um, we're, we're finding issues that are arising that we need that interagency approach. And of course, you know, EWO, um, our vulnerable children that need children's services support and so on. And, and I think with a lot of our EA staff working from home, um, it's very difficult for them um, at, the pre at the present moment um, to address some of those welfare concerns. And, and that, is, that is an issue. Um, we, um, and I can speak from a personal level on this with my own school, 
it, it's very difficult. Uh, there is a vast inequality in, in relation to um, the amount of access that some pupils do have. Uh, for that access education online. Uh, we as a school and our members, school, we're, we're all monitoring what's going on every day with engagement and so on. But there is inequality among the year groups. And, the, and we do welcome, and we did welcome, the announcement about more and additional IT equipment. Uh, the priority in the first term was that equipment going to our year 12s and our year 14 examination classes. And I think to a certain extent, the key stage three pupils missed out there and that's where we're trying to fill that vacuum at the moment in relation to um, equipping those children who are vulnerable and may not have access. Um, but I think more investment into Wi-Fi and broadband access for across the whole school estate. Um, and I know if we look at the other jurisdictions, for example, in Wales and in Scotland, um, the planning in um, our C2K system is, is uh, 20 years old now. And I think it really needs to be looked at whether it's fit for purpose anymore. And looking at our other jurisdictions, um, there has been a heavy investment in IT equipment for um, school staff and pupils. Um, and I think that that has benefited their, their systems. Uh, but we're concerned, you know, at the lack of that updated system. And that could have a consequence on, on learning uh, moving forward. And I think that that's something that's uh, very important. But that interagency support and support of our vulnerable children is a thing that needs to be looked at because they may be the kids that aren't engaging in remote learning at the minute as well. Thank you for that, Jackie. Um, I fully agree with you. That's um, what I should definitely look at. Um, thank you, Chair. That's all for me. Thank you, Nicola. Can I bring in uh, Justin? Justin McNulty, MLA. Hi guys, sorry I just put getting mute off there. Um, Thanks, Justin. Thank you very much for coming today and thank you very much for all, all of you for your important evidence. Um, how are you all? How are your members? How are your members dealing with the trauma they've been placed under throughout this pandemic, the, the challenges, the compromises in, in their, you know, their, their well-being being challenged all the time and being told that they're doing the right thing and for, to fears that they've been dealing with in terms of their own health and safety, their family's health and safety, their pupils' health and safety, the staff's health and safety. How are your members, guys? How are, you, how are, you, how are they getting on? Uh, well, if I can answer that, um, uh, Justin, they, they, they are under um, immense pressure and it is having a big impact on their own mental health and wellbeing. Um, <laughs> The period leading up to Christmas was extremely uh, broad for teachers. Um, they were watching the numbers increasing, and we had the bizarre plan that schools were going to close from the 25th of January. I mean, just think of it that now. What would have happened if we had had schools open uh, now? And that was the plan that people faced, and that caused immense pressure uh, on teachers. And one of the big issues, of course, is teachers who have their own childcare issues as well. And as bad as it is for the whole workforce, the pressure on special school staff, as Caroline articulated early, earlier, is absolutely unbelievable. They are working for two metres. It just does not exist. There are another school, there are attempts depending from school to school for two metres in place. In special schools, the reality is it just does not happen. And we even have advice from the PHA that I think this plan doesn't make sense. You know, a school that's born in the PHA that if one parent has COVID, say from day one to day 10, the second parent has COVID from day six to day 16, the child who hasn't tested positive can attend school after the 10th day, even though a parent at home has COVID. Now, that, I couldn't believe it when I was informed about it and I checked. That is the current advice on the PHA website. And I would say this committee should be uh, raising that as a matter of urgency with PHA. Why are they advising that children with a family member at home who has COVID can attend school? It, it absolutely should not be happening. The teachers in that school this morning uh, are absolutely distressed about this. I mean, the school, I'll tell you the name of the school. The school is Mitchell House in Belfast. 
not shocking, Justin, not shocking. So you're telling me that the advice is, the health advice is for children from a family where there is COVID positive cases should go to school. Yes, they are saying after 10 days of the child not being positive or having symptoms, they can attend school, even though another household member may have subsequently uh, got COVID. And when I read it, I honestly thought, is somebody got the wrong end of the stick? But the graphic on the PHA website says, no, that was what is to happen. Which only adds to the fear and uncertainty within Absolutely the Absolutely adds to the fear that people are now going to be faced with. Uh, pupils coming in who, who, who well, clearly are unsymptomatic, but are coming from households uh, with COVID. Yeah, and, and on the top of that, Justin, how, and how do the, the other uh, representatives here today feel about the evidence coming from the UK yesterday, where it's the data shows that there's a higher rate of COVID infection within the teaching workforce and staff workforce than in other areas of society. That data has been demonstrated. How does that make you, your teachers feel? I, th I think really it's a summary of how they've been feeling over the, the last couple of months till this since this started. They feel battered. They feel battered by COVID in their professional life and in their personal life. Many of them are parents and carers themselves and the impact that that's having on them. They feel battered by the minister and the department in their lack of um, clear advice and guidance. They feel battered by the PHA in a lack of clarity. Those figures should be available here as well. There's no reason why they shouldn't. We wrote to the PHA at the, begin at the end of September and we got, we got a response, but we've still got no um, update on the reports that they told us they would give us with regards to specifics about transmission within school. They feel battered by social media and very much campaigns because parents themselves are in anxious positions and they are transmitting that onto schools. Um, currently very much within the special school system, but in, within the mainstream as well. And they feel battered trying to think forwards and think how we will get out of this and how we will get out of this positively. Um, the Education Committee have been excellent in their support and the communication they have given to teachers about what they are doing. But when we see um, very much the domination of aspects like the transfer test, and I know that is an incredibly emotive matter when we look at Northern Ireland, it is not the only thing happening within education. Of those 16,000 children that have applied to do it, how many of them will actually get places within schools? How many of the children that will not go through that form of education have been given the message recently that their education will not give them the opportunities that an elite few will receive? And it is the teachers who are dealing with that mental health outpouring from both parents and children every single day in all systems within our education process. So in, in quick response, teachers are battered at the minute beyond belief, exhausted, frightened, desperate to help, desperate to set up, step up, but um, where they are, they feel they're putting themselves at risk. Um, um, can, I I just come in, uh, can I just come in in regards to that in re uh, as a school leader? Our teachers have been amazing. Our teachers have been yep. amazing at keeping the system going in a very, very difficult time. And I think that um, in some ways, the messaging from the Department of Education has not been clear. And, and, and the guidance hasn't been clear. And when we look at our mental health and wellbeing, our teachers are keeping the mental health and wellbeing of our pupils to the fore every single day through every single class of remote learning. And I think there cannot be enough thanks given to our teaching staff. The profession has been put in a situation where they're at the forefront of everything. And I think if government are making our teachers um, engage fully and, and, and they need to make sure that they have vaccines and if we're a priority that children have to be taught our teachers need to have vaccines and be safe but they are the champions that have led this uh, course over the last number of months and have held our children um, pivotal to everything that we do in schools is our, ch our children and they are at the core of every decision that we made and our teachers have been amazing. Um, I don't know if I, if I can be heard there, if I could come in yes. from ASDL. Stephen, yes, go ahead, um, Stephen. 
just, just really to echo what Jackie said, because I appreciate what, what, what's going on here as well. I think that we do need to return to school as soon as possible. I think certainly from our members, we would like a full return to school as soon as it's safe to do so. But we realise that we're subject then to public health advice about that. But given the fact that pupils have missed so much time, I think that it is important that we try to get them back to school and we do everything we can to try to do that. That includes things like vaccination of teachers. But I just want to echo what Jackie said and say that teachers have been under enormous pressure. There have been enormous changes then over the last three weeks. People have had to deal with a lot. But I would like to pay tribute to the teachers um, who are in our schools at the moment who have shown over the last year how innovative they can be, how creative they can be, how much of a passion they have for educating people. And I think that, that we need to acknowledge that they'll stop at nothing really to make sure that this um, education continues. And also that they're intervening to make sure that pastoral support's there. They're really taking care of people's welfare. And I think that, th that they want more than anything else to be able to get back to school and to be able to see pupils. I think one of the things that we noticed when we got back in September was how much we had missed having pupils in school. And I think that um, that's something that we need to take on board as well. But we also have to acknowledge the, the enormous amount of work that, that teachers have done and how they've adapted to a, a changing situation over the last 12 months or so. Yes, it's been phenomenal. And I, I have to pay an unbelievable tribute to teachers who, despite being battered, despite the pressure they've been under, um, they have innovated, they have adapted, they have... Um, their, their careers have been disrupted probably more so than any other uh, profession, but yet they've, they've kept going and they've kept going for the good of the kids, which is phenomenal. In terms of special schools, what are your thoughts in terms of how the Minister has treated them the same as every other school setting, education setting, for the teachers and staff who've, who are under enormous duress right now? What's your feelings around that, the fact that those schools have been treated the same as ordinary education settings? I suppose in a way they, they haven't been treated the same in that there are mitigations put in place for ordinary settings with regards to a hope um, or an ambition of social distancing, face masks for those children in post-primary, um, including within the extension to the classroom and um, on transport. Mitigations that are brought in across the system are not transferable into the vast majority of special school situations. Um, we've also been put in to an environment where we are open. All schools are open. You know, no schools have been closed. There are, there are, I think there's very small numbers of schools that don't have any children in them. As Jackie said earlier, they're providing for vulnerable children as well, and those children of key workers. But special schools have been to told to open to all. The minister has sent out a message that schools are safe. Um, I reiterate that he, he needs to deliver the message that schools should be used as a last resort. And for many children in special schools, they are a last resort. And for many of our vulnerable children, they're a last resort. But he needs to send that broader message back out. But I don't think he actually, he's, he's treated them the same and, and not acknowledged the yeah. lack of additional support that's needed. Agreed. Okay. Shocking stuff. Um, one last question, folks, and it was mentioned earlier, um, I can't recall who it was, but in terms of the learning deficit, the widening gap, um, the greater extent to which um, children from disadvantaged backgrounds have been adversely impacted educationally because of this pandemic, what are your thoughts on how that will be addressed? Now, I've, I've sought the Minister to bring forward a recharge program to help kids catch up to help them, to, to every kid needs to catch up, but some will be further behind the others. What are your thoughts in terms of how kids can catch up? We've had an, I'm sorry, Justin, we've had an underinvested system for years. For the last 10 years, that has to change. There has to be an investment in the education of all of our children, um, an expansion of the Engage programme, a reduction in class size so that we can see a better focus for the children that are receiving an education. If we could probably fill the rest of your day, but I know you have to clear the room by 12, with ideas of what could be done within education. We would all have different ideas as practitioners and as representatives of the wider, of the wider workforce. I think I, I would echo the point made by Caroline. Um, we, 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 there needs to be a focus on those who, who are most in need. And one of the, it's 
groups in our mission and these are those in the food school meals. Um, we know that those are a group who do underperform. But the engaged program that it's target, uh, I think it's going away to making a difference, but there's still a long way to go. So it needs to be uh, rolled out further uh, and expanded. And we need to ensure there that there is the whole issue around digital access. And it goes beyond the Department of Education. It also goes to making sure we're looking at broadband with the right uh, that people can have. And I know when Jeremy Corbyn raised it, it didn't necessarily meet universal approval. But I think on reflection now, most people are saying, you know, he was on to something. We do need to be looking at broadband now uh, and internet access as a universal right. Okay. If, I could, if I could come in as well, yes, Justin Mark, briefly, Mark, Mark here thanks, from yep. NMU. Yep, thanks Mark, um, briefly, yep. One of, the, one of the things that we've been pushing since the start of, of, of this pandemic uh, is the, in order to address the sort of educational gap, is to upskill the teaching workforce, particularly in relation to the very different pedagogies involved in e-learning and in remote support. Now, there are some, uh, hundreds of teachers have gone through, you know, sort of starter courses in, in Strand Villa, so where that's 12 hour courses, but there is a real need to get a wee pot of money to actually uh, provide CPD, proper CPD in e-learning, um, in remote learning and remote support. And if you could give us any assistance there, I mean, schools presumably are making savings on, on exam fees and stuff like that, but I think there should be some program uh, they are the e-learning the e particularly would have um, more of a focus on coaching and mentoring than with classroom teaching uh, so we could do with a little bit of assistance there if that helps thanks mark thanks justin folks thank you very much for your evidence thank you very much to all your your members you're doing extraordinary work thank you thank you justin uh can i bring in morris bradley mla Morris there. Morris, can you hear us? Can you hear me now, sir? That's you, Morris. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that there. I had uh, the machine on mute. Look, can I, uh, can I thank everyone for taking the time to attend this morning? And can I join with the chair and the other committee members and expressing my grateful thanks to uh, their members for all that they do and are doing for our people in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, and I agree that the vaccination should be prioritised for uh, educational establishments, particularly special education schools. As alluded to by Justin, vaccination is something I think I raised it in the chamber, and I think it's something the minister is keen to take forward. So hopefully something will happen along those lines very, very shortly. But can I take up a point raised by Jaggy? Uh, with listening to Jaggy's concerns around the data available at primary schools, uh, is it possible that a, an organised method of collecting data across all schools should now be looked at so that all primary schools will have the same data collection and the confidential nature of that data collected to be used then uh, if we ever have a situation like this again. Jackie, um, you <laughs> yeah, I'll just come in on that. Yes. I, I mean, to me, that's not what the nature of data is in the primary school. Yeah. That in the primary school can inform the learning and it's not designed to, um, you know, compare children or compare across schools. We are in the process and we will be moving forward in the process of revisiting um, assessment at, at primary school level and right the way through, actually. Um, and one of the conclusions we came to from the previous um, assessment structure that we had was that you can't use assessment that you're using in order to inform your teaching with the children to, you know, have a systems check and compare children against each other. So just when we're looking at, you know, looking at this advantage, bringing those children on, I don't think whenever we're looking at assessment that we should be looking at assessment to to compare children one to the other or compare across schools. I think our assessment at that level should be to inform our learning to ensure that our children develop their own individual journeys. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's good. Thanks very much for that, Jackie. Uh, let's just pick up on something that you had said about the, the, uh, the inequalities of how the data was collected and how it was available and the confidentiality issues. So, thanks very much for that. I, I have another question, a couple of questions here uh, for Mark. Uh, 
And when we started to agree with Mark, uh, the, the thing for possibility that children by showing those symptoms at school can uh, can be carriers and take the virus home to probably one of the adults. Uh, and one of the points that Mark raised was about classroom size. Mark, do you think we have enough teachers to achieve a one to twelve ratio of classrooms and a some school settings enough room to have an extra classroom? And do we have enough teachers in place, especially for uh, uh, special education in these schools? The cover uh, and remain open. I have your thoughts on that, please. It's a good question, Morris. I mean, and you may well be right. I mean, I think the general principle that we're trying to get to is, is lower classroom sizes mm -hmm. and, and rotational learning. Whilst we're in the middle of a, a period where the infection rate is high, um, so I mean that'll vary from school to school. To be quite honest, and in some schools you're quite right that that you wouldn't be able to get down to say twelve. You know, um, if you split the class in two, for instance. So it'll, it'll be it'll be a different picture in almost every school. The difficult to achieve part. Absolutely difficult to achieve, but I think I think the general principle is that is that we need we need more social distance, lower class sizes, insofar as we can do it. Mm -hmm. um, there's no there's no um, one fits all here, Morris. That uh, you know you, you're quite right. Mm -hmm. The other point, Chair, uh, thanks for that, Mark. The other point, Chair, I'd like to, to, to raise is I've got a lot of uh, correspondence and que queries regarding pupils who were hoping to do reset examinations. Uh, many pupils are relying on these resets uh, for GCSE and A level results to ensure university placings. Pupils in this situation have worked extremely hard to improve their grades. Do you think, or have any of you an opinion on how this extra work can be properly graded? And I'll sort of use as an example somebody who got a D and an E last year, but put in an awful lot of hard work and effort to make that D and E an A or a B. Uh, how is this managed without examination? Uh, as most of these people, that I've been calling to you, I would have prepared you taking place in the research. Uh, do you remember, what do your members feel about this situation at the moment? Um, I, I think, Morris, we, we did, we, we've all met with CCEA and I mean, one of the proposals they have outlined is that schools will be able to use uh, material from CCEA uh, to get assessments in those type of circumstances that can inform uh, the teacher predicted grade along with the other information. And we, I mean, uh, as somebody who was a teacher, I'm all too well aware there are children who do underperform maybe in the first year of the course, maybe they come back and reset. And you, you, you know from your professional experience with them that they're putting the effort in. Um, and I'm quite sure teachers will use their professionalism to make sure that um, the materials can be used to get uh, the real grade that the pupil is now working at. I'm not, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, and um, you know, the system's not going to be perfect, but uh, teachers aren't going to leave somebody behind. Okay, thanks very much. I just I worry about the situation that we were left in last year that we could be facing something similar this year with uh, a lot of discontent amongst pupils. Well, that's me, Chair. Thank you very much. And um, thank you very much to all you people for coming in and uh, providing answers. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Morris. Okay, uh, I'll just have a, a couple of short questions, and, and I think some members might want to ask very brief supplementaries as well. Um, I think what's really clear from the evidence session today is a, a shared priority uh, to have children in school uh, and to sustain learning and to address learning deficits. Um, key to that um, is reducing community transmission of COVID and vaccination, but we've had other suggestions today in terms of reducing class sizes, reducing bubble sizes, increasing social distancing in schools. And obviously, to really achieve any of those suggestions, schools need extra staff, extra space, extra cleaning, uh, blended learning capacity, contact tracing capacity, and that requires extra resource funding and extra capital funding. The Minister's um, programme to deliver that is, was and is the Engage programme. So could I ask um, representatives from ASCL and NAHT, um, how effective 
the and, and fit for purpose the engage program has been to meet those needs and whether additional resource funding and capital funding is required to be able to put those circumstances in place that would aid safe return to school. Stephen or Scott want to respond to that to start with? Okay, if I could come in on, on that one. Thanks, Scott. Um, uh, yeah, uh, in terms of if, if the, the circumstances under which schools return, what, what, once we know what they are, and if there's any additional mitigation that needs to be put in place, some of the solutions talked uh, about this morning uh, would require additional staffing, additional qualified staff, uh, additional space uh, and additional cost, especially putting in, in uh, much needed additional support um, for those pupils who have disengaged with the remote learning process uh, and those pupils who may have been disadvantaged during the remote learning uh, uh, lockdown time um, but because of their personal and family circumstances. Schools have done a phenomenal amount to try and support these pupils, but the face-to-face -face individual support is required. So uh, it, it comes back to, yeah, schools have been underfunded, education has been underfunded for over a decade, um, and we're dealing with additional pressures and additional challenges uh, and additional drains in our resources. Um, so uh, any additional funding that would uh, allow us uh, initially to enhance our um, partial as well as our academic support uh, would, would be very welcomed indeed. Can, can I just come in there as well, Chris? Yes. And just say, that, you know, it was mentioned earlier about the infrastructure as well in C2K. I think one of the things that's becoming apparent to schools is that we have an outdated system. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we lack in school is, is Wi-Fi that's reliable. And I think that that's really a pressing issue because we have a number of pupils, obviously, who are self-isolating, who need to be taught. And as I said before, teachers have been innovative. We've had people who have been streaming lessons to people's homes, who have been live teaching and getting people involved at that stage as well. But we just really lack the uh, stable Wi-Fi and things like that. So I think we do need investment in that side of school as well to make uh, that blended approach possible. Yeah, we've we've um, we've introduced the term blended learning and remote learning like it was a switch that could be flicked overnight for you guys to be able to, to do this. And how, how, how have you experienced that? Well, as I said before, I think teachers have really made enormous strides and I think, think they're doing things and they've adapted in ways that we wouldn't have imagined this time last year. Uh, so I think it's just extraordinary. And I think that's one of the things that we need to bear in mind when we return to normal, because when we return to normal, it won't be the normal that we were used to. It won't be the kind of thing that we had in place beforehand. And I think that when we, when we look at the bigger picture as well, people like the inspector of the ETI need to be aware of that that the landscape in schools has changed. People have developed new skills. People have adapted what they're doing. And as I said before, I think they deserve enormous credit for that. But we do also need to invest in that infrastructure to make it, it as easy as possible for people to do that and so that there are no barriers to people being able to carry out their work in new and innovative ways. Thank, thanks um, for that. Chris, if yeah, I just... Jackie. Yeah, Jackie, just before, just, just before I bring you in as well, obviously the Engage programme doesn't include special schools, um, and that's an issue that we've raised with the minister regularly. But yeah, Jackie, that that question with regards to the the adequacy um, of the engaged programme in, in meeting mm -hmm. some of those key needs, it'd be great to hear from you on that, Jackie. Thanks. Yeah, I agree with both my colleagues. Um, you know, we have been underfunded, and and that's very very apparent. Um, I have to say, in a non-selective school with fifty eight percent preschool meals. Um, the big issue with the Engage programme, Chris, um, has been um, the access to resource in regards to our teaching professionals, substitute teachers, or having professionals being able to come in and backfill positions within the school. Uh, and that's one of the big areas I know that DE are, are looking at, um, having that resource available, especially when we hopefully get back to school as quickly as possible to face-to-face -face learning um, to be able to support our pupils. But it's something that needs planning. Yeah, it's my, so it's my understanding that um, in terms of the resource available to schools for additional staff, it was it was available if a teacher was 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 off, was absent, had a COVID related absence. T schools couldn't apply for additional staff over and above those grounds. Is that is that correct, Jackie? 
Well, the way that we've been working it in, in our school was the, the engage funding came about uh, relative to the amount of free school meals pupils that we had in our school. And therefore, we were looking at um, um, supporting additional resource and that could be done by um, looking at backfilling um, um, a, a member of staff within our school um, with a substitute teacher coming in um, or whatever way the school, there was flexibility around that, Chris. So it was up to the individual school what way they wanted to do that. Okay, okay, so you could use that engage funding? Okay. Yeah. But there, okay, and but that obviously fluctuated significantly across schools as well, though, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, we, we can certainly look at that in a bit more detail then as well. Um, okay, a anyone else want to comment on the, the adequacy of the Engage programme to, to meet those challenges that most of you have outlined are, are, are necessary for safe return? I think simply to say that there needs to be an extension, Chris, um, and and what works continue on with. The issues with regard to staffing are certainly current because of the demands with COVID, but hopefully as we move through this to the other side, that's the point when there really needs to be the investment in this system. The, the further lockdown has impacted on it, obviously. OK. OK, thank you. Um, Stephen Scott, the, our ASCL representatives present today. Um, I, I appreciate, and as I knew in advance as well, that ASCL obviously doesn't uh, adopt a, a position in relation to transfer tests. Um, so I understand if you're unable to answer questions that regard. The, the only one question that I, I did want to attempt, and I genuinely appreciate if you don't think it's possible to answer in your ASCL capacity, is whether any work has been undertaken um, toward a, a common contingency criteria in place for admission to selective schools this year? I I could, uh, if I could come, c c come back to my, my earlier statement there. Yep. When it comes to contingency criteria, um, it, it, it's down to boards of governors of individual schools. That, that's the legislation, that's the law around this. Uh, so, so each and every board uh, to, to look at their particular set of circumstances and to come up with their, their criteria. Um, so it's not something that ASCO can uh, coordinate or, or uh, insist that, that, that members uh, agree on a common uh, criteria. Okay, okay. Th thanks for that response. I suppose finally, um, uh, uh, Stephen and Scott, um, have, obviously the, the budget has been announced at a very high level this week and we're hoping to take a, a detailed briefing on it next week but um, would you have any comment on the adequacy of the, of the budget at, at this stage? Well, I, 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 I'll go first on this one. As I said, uh, uh, education in Northern Ireland has historically been underfunded uh, in comparison to uh, other jurisdictions in the United Kingdom for the past 10 years. Uh, we do the very, very best we can with uh, the resources that are delegated to us, um, but uh, we, we would appreciate any additional funding uh, that could allow us to uh, modernise and enhance the educational provision uh, that we, we provide for your youngsters, especially as we try to move back to normal in the near future. Okay. Anyone else want to comment on that briefly as well? Thanks for that, Scott. Um, Chris, I just think that um, when we get back into a, a, a new normal for schools, I think that we're going to have a fallout from all of the issues that our young people have had to deal with over the last number of months. And I think any additional funding for health and wellbeing and to promote learning uh, further within our schools will be gratefully received by all schools in all sectors. Okay. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I see Daniel McCrossan has raised a hand for a supplementary question. Um, uh, it would need to be brief, uh, and if any, anyone else wishes to ask a supplementary at this stage, please indicate to me via your uh, raised hand. Daniel? Uh, yeah, Chair, uh, thanks very much. Uh, uh, I put that hand up a while ago, but now that you've asked me, I will take the opportunity. <laughs> uh, and I noticed that uh, from the NAHT submission that you suggest many of the support services uh, for example, the EWO are not available to mainstream schools during this lockdown, as you'd like them to be uh, to help our vulnerable children. Uh, can you elaborate on your concerns and tell us what you think needs to be done? Just 
Danielle, in relation to that, um, we feel it's very important that um, children are engaged and um, our teachers and our staff in school are in, involved with the day-to-day -day learning and learning and teaching and therefore our support services are there to help that children are more engaged in their learning and we're just finding it more and more difficult um, to, to have those support services in place to ensure that those children um, and, and a lot of them vulnerable children that EWO are there to make those visits out, essential visits to schools to ask the, the pertinent questions about why children are not engaging in their learning and, and, and being able to give that feedback to us in the schools and, and that is a welfare issue. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. Um, I actually have one other question I neglected to ask as well, and for the the Northern Ireland Teaching uh, Council representatives, um, the Northern Ireland Teaching Council wrote to the First and Deputy First Minister on the 11th of January in relation to special school provision. Ha has the NITC received a response to that correspondence from FM, DFM, or the Minister for Education? No, no uh, we haven't, Chris. Okay. And that, uh, I mean, uh, just an acknowledgement to say it's been received, but no response. Okay. Maybe um, the Education Committee could write to uh, those correspondents and uh, seek a, an update on your behalf as well, then. Okay, mm -hmm. members, that, that, that draws our evidence session to a close. Um, would, would any of our witnesses like to make a, a very, very, very brief closing remark on any of the issues that raised, or are you content? Okay. Content, Thanks. Content. Thanks. Hope, look, hopefully, hopefully, all of you feel like um, that's been a positive engagement today. We, we, we dedicated our, our committee session today um, to engagement with six teaching unions um, and we have found it extremely constructive and useful uh, to engage with you. I hope you've all, um, you all feel like you've had a fair wind in, in raising the, the wide range of issues that you've been able to raise today and we as a committee will continue to do our best to advocate um, on behalf of you, your members and the children and young people that we're all working for, um, for to the, the Northern Ireland Executive and to the Department of Education on your behalf. So thank, thank you very much indeed for, your, for all that you're doing and for your time with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, members, if I could ask the clerk, uh, ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all of the witnesses and add all of the members back into the spotlight, keep them there until the end of the meeting, and ask the clerk to summarise any actions or requests for additional information resulting uh, from the, the briefing today. Okay, um, members, um, I think uh, you, we want to write to the department summarising the issues raised by the unions there. Um, specifically in regards to messaging um, guidance, messaging from the department, guidance from um, PHA um, for, for teachers, pressure on special schools once more, um, funding um, generally um, in the COVID uh, context and the recovery context of return to schools, um, the success of the ENGAGE programme um, and, and funding for that again, uh, particularly in respect of returning. Um, welfare, the welfare matter that was raised um, in regards to uh, schools being able to get feedback on pupils who aren't engaging um, and then um, on testing uh, just the, the position that came across there um, about what uh, primary school primary schools should be expected to provide um, um, and then specifically uh, William had um, the proposal that the committee should write to the Public Health Agency and the Education Authority and the Department on the need to share information um, better than... The well, it was based on the fact that, 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 yeah, that, that they were saying, I think she said that Caroline said that there was a meeting yesterday uh, with some PHA officials, some principals, and, and if that's being shared with some principals, but not all, then that's obviously a failing, and I think that's, that sort of sharing of information needs to happen. Uh, and I think they all need to... All, all three of them need to be because many of the decisions that were taken. The minister referred to a name check PHA a number of t occasions last week about guidance. That needs to be out there then, you know. And and if it's not, there's a feeling. Okay. Um, then, 
another specific uh, point was um, to ask for urgent liaison with the economy minister um, in respect of cancellation of BTEC. I think that was Nicola's questioning. Yep. Um, for clarity for pupils and consistency of the public safety approach. Um, and then the chair's uh, point at the end um, about uh, writing to FM and DFM to ask for that reply to the INTO letter of 11th of January. Um, in respect of special schools, NATC, but yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's what I have. Is there anything additional, members? Yeah. Any Any other members wish to add to that, um, or, or sure. any comments? Yeah, Justin. Yeah, just that issue that was raised in relation to the PHA guidance for pupils return to school. Um, I think that's a big time red flag. <clears throat> I think we need to seek urgent clarity from PHA, the minister. To let us know what what is actual advice there, because it doesn't seem sensible to me, um, and obviously it wasn't sensible to the teaching unions. And if we may, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't raise it earlier with the unions when they were here. Can we write to the minister seeking his uh, um, steer on where where things are at for substitute teachers? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, Rob Newton. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's maybe it's the point that uh, Justin is making, and he raised it. Um, it, it became particularly uh, pertinent to me when Mitchell House Special School was mentioned, because that's in East Belfast constituency. I, I, I think is that what you're talking about, Justin? Is that that yeah. case you're talking about? I, I think that's. If you don't mind me saying so, Justin, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's adequate for us to contact. PHA, I think we do need to go up to the minister on this issue. Yep. Now, I think if we do that, it seems to me like a strange case, but there may be other factors in it, but I think it's a ministerial level. Uh, so if, you, if the committee agree to that, sure, I think that's where that should go. Agreed, agreed. Yep. Agreed. Justin, uh, just, just sorry, Chair, I, I have an answer from the Minister on the teachers that came through uh, late yesterday evening, so I'll, if anyone wants it, I'll forward it around. He's just putting uh, the same scheme in, in, in place as he did last time, right? Okay. That, that's in terms of pay uh, coverage yeah. for substitute teachers, yep. Okay. Well, yeah, we, can, we, can, we can write as well just to get a, an update in relation to that to provide to, to members. Okay, members, any, any other comments or questions? No. Okay, members, and there'll be a few matters arising from uh, that session that we can maybe address in Ford Work Programme uh, as well. But if members are content to agree those actions, agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, then I'll move to agenda item six, correspondence. Uh, can I refer members to page 34, where we have 11 items of correspondence and a summary note is included at pages 35 to 36. And can I ask the clerk to speak to the summary note at page 35? Yeah. Um, Sorry, before I start you there. Daniel, Daniel and other members, you might want to put yourselves on mute just um, when you're not speaking there, just so um, you can't be overheard. Thank you. Sorry, clerk. Members, um, I would draw to your attention uh, item 6.2 at page 37. It's correspondence from the Children's Law Centre, um, including, including, closing a report produced by it and other NGOs seeking to inform the list of issues uh, to be sent to the UK government by the Committee on the Rights of the Child in February. Um, so uh, initially I'd like to seek the Committee's agreement to send that material to, to the Department, as it is the lead Department, um, and ask how it is planning to take this forward. Is that agree? Yeah, agreed. Yeah, happy with that. Agreed. Um, Thank you. Item 6.3 at page 195 is correspondence from Pivotal on its report um, on New Decade, New Approach, one year on. Um, again, I propose that the committee forward that to the department, um, seeking its views um, on the section of the report about education. Agreed. Members agreed. I'm not <laughs> getting that on page 195, Chair. Um, that, should, no, did I get? Should be there, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, sorry, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. No problem. Members that need you to agree uh, correspondence actions here, if that's okay, or members can. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay, Clark. Um, item item six point seven actually is relevant um, to your discussion just now. On page two hundred and six, and um, that's correspondence about payments for substitute teachers for the period of school closures. And again, it's a um, member of the public who's uncertain about the arrangements um, okay. and should know. So can we write to DA about that? Agreed. Members um, agreed. Yeah. Thank you. And, um, item 6.8 on two, page 207 is a departmental response um, to issues regarding looked after children. Um, advising that the acronym LAC will no longer be used. Um, but it also shares the strategy implementation plan and the children's rights impact assessment. The department has not, however, answered some of the committee's questions um, about the 14 to 19 strategy and the provision of alternative education. So I'm seeking committee agreement um, to write again to the department on those matters that have been omitted. Agreed. 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 Um, great. That's hugely positive. That acronym has been removed. Fantastic news. Well done. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> what acronym are they going to use? <laughs> no, you don't use acronyms when you're talking about children. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Justin. Um, so, item 610 on page 272 is a response from the Department about the Children and Young People Strategy. Um, a lot of interesting material there. Is the committee content to get an update on the work of the decision making um, project team and keep a watching brief on the Children and Young Person Strategy? Members agreed. 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 Okay. Thank you. Um, item 612 on page 305 is a further response from the Department on funding arrangements from um, SCOTEN. Um, D D the Department indicates that the Minister met with Dr Purdy um, and uh, that the next step would be to um, explore the Department for the Economy's position on the matter. Um, so I'm proposing that the Committee notes that response and copies it to Dr Purdy. Agreed. 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 Um, do members have any other comments on the general correspondence in the folder? Members, any other comments on correspondence? Content with those actions? Yep. Content. Okay. Thank you, members. Then, agenda item seven is our forward work programme. Can I refer members to the draft forward work programme at page uh, 309? Um, and I have a few suggestions to make in this regard as well. If you bear with me and thank you for your forbearance in relation to forward work programme in recent weeks uh, a few urgent matters have um, changed some of those items and, and thank the, the clerk and the committee staff for the work they've done in that regard as well um, I, I would uh, clerk next week we're, we're scheduled to hear from the ETI on remote learning isn't that right yeah yes. um, I propose there is a, an organisation called Blended Northern Ireland um, which is a, a wide range of teachers from um, across schools in Northern Ireland that are, are working on best practice in remote learning. I'd propose that we, or our theme for next week would be remote learning and we hear from ETI and Blend Ed Northern Ireland on remote learning. Um, perhaps we could, ex uh, ETI are obviously referenced by the Department, and and Department of Education and the Education Authority as um, LINK. Um, provision on remote learning to schools, but I'd be content to hear from DE or EEA if they have representatives that they would like to contribute to a session on remote learning. Um, then on Wednesday the 3rd of February... Um, can I just say... Yep, that, sorry. Um, sorry, ahead, Wednesday, Clark, yeah. Wednesday the 27th, the um, ETI are scheduled to come um, and also we had CCEA in there. Um, as you'll see, the Forward Work Programme says that's on public examinations uh, for 2021 um, and also arrangements for transfer. So, in fact, it's a bit premature for the for CCA to come about transfer because the Minister hasn't decided a position yet and um, they, um, there are also matters that they don't intend to comment on. So, yeah, um, yeah it, would, it would not be unreasonable to ask them to maybe come at a later date. Time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think so. Um, on, on that note, if Wednesday the 3rd of February, the mental we had members had mentioned inviting the mental health, the interim mental health champion, um, to engage with the committee on, around mental health and action for children 
um, and in particular their Blues programme had been mentioned as um, an organisation for us to engage with on the issue of mental health and wellbeing for children and young people. I propose that we would take those two sessions on Wednesday the 3rd of February. Um, are there, are, there, are there sessions in for 3rd of February at the moment, Clark? Yeah, so at the moment, the 3rd of February does have the um, Mental Health Champion. Okay. Um, previously, the committee put the Blues programme on the 17th of February alongside the sports update. Okay. Um, and the other thing that's in for the 3rd is, the, um, is feedback on a consultation on COVID-19 action plan for vulnerable children. Um, okay. And the department are planning to come... Um, and, and have provided uh, some, something for the committee to read about that. So, so is that the, the feedback? On, I thought that had been delayed to a later date. No, the, the uh, uh, Vulnerable Children Action Plan is scheduled for the 3rd of February then? It is scheduled, yeah. Okay. The, um, another, another consultation, um, which was in the programme for the 3rd of March, it's the consultation on the um, Special Educational Needs Framework and Regulations and Code okay. of Practice. That will now be delayed until um, later in April. Okay. So okay. So the okay. So Wednesday the third then so would Wednesday. be the Vulnerable Children Action Plan and the Mental Health Champion then. Yeah, yeah. that's as it stands. Okay. Um, the tenth of February then. Um, my my thoughts were that would be timely to have the Education Minister return with regards to school restart, and I think. Other members had mentioned previously that uh, an invitation for the PHA, Chief Medical Officer, Chief Scientific Advisor, um, would be timely in line with that also. Um, uh, and then but you, we may also want the reschedule of SIA ex on exams um, at that point as well, as the Minister should have reported on alternative contingency arrangements. Is it, Clark, is it possible to take the Education Minister? Uh, the health advisors and SIA in that session, or is that too many? Um, so it's room twenty nine. So it's a three hour. It is a three -hour. meeting. Um, is it a nine to twelve day? It's, that a, nine day? To, it's a nine to twelve. Okay, that might that, day, that yeah. might be too many then. Okay. Members, what what are your what are your thoughts in terms of um, uh, the importance of um, PHA, CMO, CSA attending? Um, on the same day as, as the Minister with regards to school restart? Chair, I don't think you're going to be able to fit them all in. No, I don't think so. so. You're going to have to work something out because you said only have a minute's room. It's at least two hours. Yeah, it is. Um, okay. Do you what's, want to... what's the length of the meeting duration if it's moved to the chamber, the assembly chamber? The Senate? No, the Assembly Chamber. Oh, sorry. If the, if the meeting was held in the Assembly Chamber, how, what would the duration be? Oh. Are there limits on the time in the, in the Assembly Chamber? It's been set up for use now, hasn't it? Yeah. Oh, well, my right. committee, public accounts already used it. I'll have to find that out. And Maybe. we were told yesterday at Chair's okay. Liaison that the screens are imminent. They've been ordered and they're imminent. So by the time we get to that date it may well be in place, um, so Starleaf can, can actually operate in the assembly chamber as well. Okay, okay. so we'll have to find well, out. Yeah. There's, about, there's about a three or four week lead in time for those screens. Uh, Wednesday, we're looking at Wednesday the 10th, which is three weeks away. It's also, I mean, at, at this moment in time, school restart is scheduled for, uh, my understanding is February the 15th. Um, so my, my thought was that. Wednesday the 10th of February would be a timely uh, session at which to invite the Education Minister on school restart and I think as Daniel had suggested previously it might be prudent for us to be hearing from PHA, Chief Medical Officer, Chief Scientific Advisor with regards to safe route school restart as well. We do need to hear from SIA on exams um, fairly soon as well. Um, so, okay. but but it would be difficult to do all of that in the same day potentially. Yeah. Well, we have we have communicated to uh, the Department of Health that we want to have them on the tenth. Okay. Um. So we can also we haven't had um a confirmation yet. So we can also ask, and we still have another week or so to look at the planning of it. Okay. Um. And I'll find out about the assembly chamber. Um. 
because I'm not aware of that. Time wise, yeah. Yeah, time wise. Okay. Um, and then CL, CLG, there have, there's been a lot of discussion at CLG, which the chairperson's going to come on to yes, shortly. Yes, that's so right. <laughs> that might have an impact on some of this too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess, I guess for Dr. McBride and, and Ian Young, it's a case of when they're available as well, Chair, as the clerk mm -hmm. just said. You know, yeah. giving them a, a particular date may not work. Okay. Maybe asking them for dates. Yeah, that's a that's a fair comment. Okay, so um, Clark, next week will be remote learning with uh, ETI and blended NI. Um, when we can, I can give you details to see if they're available. Um, Wednesday, the third of February, is the Vulnerable Children's Action Plan and the pot potentially the interim uh, mental health champion. And then Wednesday, the tenth, we will seek availability of Education Minister. Um, PHA, CMO, CSA, and maybe if we seek availability from SIA as well then in relation to exams, um, I can provide members with an update in terms of the scheduling of all of those at next week's meeting. Is that our members content? Does that sound reasonable, Clark? Yes, it yeah. does. Members okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. Agreed? Okay. Members wish to add any other suggestions to the forward work programme? I would just make the point, Chair, I think I made it when we were discussing it um, a few weeks ago, the whole issue of Professor O'Neill coming are very much welcome because the, because the children's general um, mental health and well-being going forward is something I think this committee needs to turn more attention to in the next remaining months. I agree. I think remote learning is an urgent issue for next week, but I agree that mental health and well-being and, and vulnerable children um, are, are other key issues that we've sought to prioritise, so I'm glad they're programmed for the next two weeks, and I'll, I'll, I'll return to the committee with Chair. an update on, on those other sessions. Um, yep, yeah. Robbie? Chair, um, yesterday, um, uh, something that we've discussed before, but it was something that I think we need to, to bear in mind, um, uh, during question time, Minister for Communities, I made some really good points about the anti-poverty strategy, and she talked a little bit about there was obviously scope within the consultation to look at maybe um, uh, children's poverty, uh, maybe as, even as a standalone piece. So that's going to be developed, I think she'd said, by December. I think it'd be remiss of us not to uh, seek to engage in some way in that um, as, a, as, a, as a committee, because we know that the correlation between educational underachievement and mental health is closely intertwined with uh, poverty for, for children. So just thinking if there's a way maybe we could also put that into the, the forward work plan or maybe bringing someone in from the Department of Communities at some stage to see if we can respond um, to that consultation. Okay. Yep. Chair, can I just, Robin? Uh, just to add to what Robbie's saying and maybe just a, a, a piece of information uh, and tell me how we might, might get this if it's even if it's necessary to do a bit of research. Uh, the number of pupils, uh, primary school pupils in particular, I think, Chair, that we'd be living in a, a won't be regarded as a poverty situation. If you don't, if we don't have the facts and figures around it, then it's much more difficult to to uh, question the, the the pieces of work that are done uh, later. Okay, happy to note those. Yep. Okay. Ask for research on that then. Yep. Okay, members content with those four work items for now. Agreed. Here, I'm, ju I'm, ju I'm, just, I'm just thinking about the, the questions around poverty and the points that are raised. I'm just wondering how we measure it. Uh, is it going to be based on free school meetings or are there going to be other indicators considered? I think, I think that's because the purpose of the research, isn't it, Robin? Yeah. 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 I think that's, that's where we need to come from. We need to understand what the base is uh, and, and what measurements are being put in place, how many are involved in it. And indeed, I suppose an aspect that I would be particularly keen on is the number of uh, children that are living in poverty, but in fact that the parents are actually working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, working for Robin, I think that's, that, that's, that's very true, the working for So if, if, in terms of um, Robbie and Robin's suggestions there, if we consider a, a briefing from potentially Department for Community officials with regards to where the Education Committee um, could contribute to work being undertaken on child poverty um, and, and research to help inform our understanding of the measurement of, of child poverty. Members content with that? Agreed? Yes, sure, thank you. Okay. Um, I, uh, 
Okay, that's agreed uh, on four more program. Agenda item eight is any other business. Um, can I inform members that the business committee confirmed today that the committee motion um, on special educational needs provision uh, during COVID will be debated in the assembly chamber on Tuesday, the twenty sixth of of January. And um, can I ask members to indicate if they have any other business? No. Okay, Clark, can, I, can we maybe move into closed session briefly just to discuss some of the chairperson's liaison group feedback with regards to the uh, nature of the meetings? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah sure. Okay. Yep. Intent. Oh, can okay, members just move into closed session briefly? Is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee. Okay, members, then agenda item nine is date and time of next formal meeting. The next formal committee meeting is scheduled to begin on Wednesday, the 27th of January 2021 in, uh, in a virtual session by Starleaf at 9.30 a.m. Uh, can I put the question the committee does not adjourn? Adjourn. Three. Thank you. Thanks, members. Committee room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee room 29.